before we, I want to do the official uh, roll call and I'll ask the board members to give us their full name and whether or not they have any new declarations regarding conflict of interest. Uh, Steve Brandt, uh, no new declarations. Virginia? Virginia Dale, no new declarations. Tom? Tom Holzer, no new declarations. Tanya? Tanya Heikola, I have one declaration. I am uh, currently working with Professor Mark Rubel at uh, uh, University of California, Davis. And uh, we are analyzing some data and working on a report from the survey that he recently administered on the science enterprise in the Delta. And I don't anticipate any conflicts, but if uh, that research or reporting becomes subject to ISB review, I would certainly recuse myself from that. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Jay Lund, uh, no new declarations. Diane. Diane McKnight, no new declarations. Uh, Bob. Bob Nyman, uh, no new declarations. And Lisa. Lisa Wanger, no new declarations. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Joe Fernando will not be here today or tomorrow. He is uh, in the field doing research. Um, for the agenda, to, today's agenda, we'll be hearing a series of presentations to better orient the Delta ISB on Delta science issues and management issues. And on day two, we'll have our uh, normal meeting, but we'll be spending most of our time talking about current and future ISB reviews. So I'll move on to item number two, which is the uh, uh, orientation presentations. Uh, First off, we're going to hear about the operations of the State Water Project and Central Valley Project. The DWR and Kristen White from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, these presentations were, uh, <clears throat> we're having a series of presentations in January and February to kind of orient the board to some of the major science issues, the major management issues uh, in the Delta. This came up for a couple of reasons. One is for new board members, we wanted to get a more thorough background of some of the real complexities of the science and management issues. And we decided to have a series of presentations on water issues in January and a series of presentations on uh, fish in uh, February. We'll talk more about how those are progressing. The second reason for doing this is that with the Delta Science Program's assessment of the board, recommendations that we better familiarize ourselves with agencies, with management issues, and, and uh, uh, overall realities of Delta science and management, that we should spend more time talking to agencies and, listen, and more or less listening to agencies. So that's the reason for as well for these uh, presentations today. Um, we've asked uh, John and Kristen to provide a uh, overview of how the projects are op uh, operated, key management challenges, and provide any insights on how the Delta ISB uh, could help. Um, we specifically asked if they could talk about how the project is operated and management, what are the key managed, what are the key issues with management, how are the projects coordinated, how science and monitoring are used to inform operations, and how can we, the Delta Independent Science Board, help. And so with that, uh, the first uh, we'll go through two presentations and then open it up for questions. The first uh, presentation is by uh, Kristen White. Thank you, and thanks to the board for having me here. Uh, happy to be here to give a quick overview of the Central Valley Project. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry, I should introduce myself. My name is Kristen White. I am the operations manager for uh, the Central Valley Project with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, we are in the California Great Basin region of the, of the Bureau of Reclamation, which is uh, which is one of five regions. Um, so the Bureau of Reclamation operates in the in the 17 western states. We have over 300 dams and over 400 reservoirs, uh, quite a bit of storage capacity, over 200 uh, million acre feet. We also uh, so we're the largest wholesaler of water in the U.S., but we also produce a significant amount of power, uh, equivalent of about uh, powering about three hundred, three and a half million homes. So, um, so basically, water and power is kind of the the core of of what we're doing. But it's uh, of course gets a lot more complex than that. So that's kind of a quick overview of the agency in general. Next slide. So 
So we focus a little bit more in the Central Valley project, which is one of the projects within, within our California Great Basin region. Our project came a little bit late to the game. So we, we will go through a little bit of the history of when we started, but, uh, but we came in, unlike some of the other uh, projects that we have in other basins, we came in uh, after there were a significant number of, um, of uh, irrigation and water projects that were already developed throughout the system. Um, so, so with that, we still have over 270 contracts and agreements and we deliver water to about 29 of the 58 California uh, counties. That's about 20% of the total water supply, 30% of the ag, and 13% of the m &I, uh, or municipal and industrial, uh, which is mostly uh, urban um, users. And then we uh, deliver to about 19 wildlife refuges. Central Valley Project also produces quite a bit of power, 2.8 billion kilowatt hours. That's equivalent to about 650,000 people served. Our project is what we call a net power producer, meaning we produce more power than we use. Um, so when we produce it, we, uh, we first use the, the power that we need and then we sell the rest of it. And our project is unique in that it is uh, very, very closely operated with the state water project and some local systems because we all share uh, the same rivers. So we're all using the Sacramento and San Joaquin. So there's a heavy amount of coordination that we'll talk, a lot, talk about a little bit more in a few slides. Next slide. So uh, a big question if you're new to California water and, and either uh, the Central Valley Project or the State Water Project is why are we here? Why does this project exist and what are we trying to do? Uh, so in California, we're a little bit mismatched between what we have and what we need. So most of the precipitation is falling in the north and most of the demand for that precipitation is in the central and southern parts of the state. So it's uh, for both agricultural and m and uh, Also the wet season, is in the winter and spring, and the need for that water is typically in the summer and fall. If you're not familiar with California, and I, I'm not, I'm originally from the East Coast, or I'm, I, I'm not from here, uh, then uh, it's, it's hard to imagine, but it, it literally, once it stops raining, and uh, usually sometime in the early summer, it is almost completely bone dry all the way until the end of the fall. So uh, without irrigated agriculture, uh, you wouldn't be able to grow a tomato plant in, in the Central Valley, um, unlike maybe some of the areas that we think are a little bit more drier in the central part of the state where they at least do get some precipitation. Also our precipitation, uh, sorry, was there a question? Hey Bob. Can uh, people mute their mics please, thanks. Uh, also, precipitation varies significantly from year to year. Uh, John will talk about this a little bit in his presentation, um, but uh, as an example, uh, we, we just had two, we had the wettest year on record, 2017, uh, and we had 2019, which was also a very wet year, and then we had 2020 and 2021, which together were some of the driest conditions we've ever seen in this, uh, in this state since we've been recording things. So they're extremely variable. Um, our demands, however, are not very variable. Uh, we, we pretty much have um, constant demands, particularly in the central and southern parts of the state. Next slide. So uh, in with that, basically trying to move that water around from, from season to season, from, uh, from wet to, uh, from north to south and from wet to dry, we have a number of challenges. So we're operating the project for a number of purposes. Uh, the primary purpose is flood control. Almost all of our dams, and I'll try to uh, remember to say which ones are not, but all of our dams are placed where they're at uh, and sized for flood control. Um, that's, uh, so that, that's their, their first purpose, and then uh, the rest of the um, project purposes have to do with how that water is used. Uh, we were also authorized for river regulation, uh, which um, was a lot more uh, critical um, early on in the project than it is now, um, for fish and wildlife, for water supply, for power generation, and for recreation. So some of those challenges I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, especially if you live in California. We've got droughts and floods, of course, as I mentioned. We've got climate change, which is, uh, which is really uh, changing how we look at our historical data sets that we've been using for quite a long time. Oh, oh can you go back, please? Okay, thanks. Uh, we have uh, aging infrastructure. Much of this infrastructure is uh, was put in place in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it's uh, seeing a lot of challenges with subsidence, um, with uh, with um, 
uh, basically just in, getting to the end of its lifespan. We've got growing population, uh, which makes uh, our demands change. We have changing hydropower markets. Um, when wind and solar come online, it changes how what the demand is for hydropower, which, uh, which causes some um, uh, challenges in how we manage our power system. Uh, we also have groundwater and subsidence challenges, and I know the state is dealing with that on a much larger level. Uh, that, that puts a lot of uncertainty in our operations. Uh, we have invasive species. We have regulations and coordination, which we'll talk about a little bit more, which are um, kind of our, our daily challenges. And then we have uh, water quality compliance and lastly, endangered species protection. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at the major Central Valley project facilities. So we started in the 1940s, uh, kind of at the top and the bottom with Shasta Dam up top and then uh, Fryant Dam down, down, uh, down south. Um, and then the, the canals that were related to that as well as Jones Pumping Plant. Uh, notably Jones Pumping Plant was built before uh, all of the rest of the, the Delta systems were, were in place. Uh, and in the mid 1950s, we built Folsom Dam, uh, which is our, um, Kind of our well, we'll talk about it a little bit more. It's a it's a kind of our workhorse dam that uh, that that uh, has a high potential of filling every year. Then in the 60s, we added the Trinity Division, which is basically exporting water from the Klamath system off of the Trinity River into the Sacramento River. And then in the late 60s, we had the addition of the State Water Project that we operate that we operate the systems with, uh, and then we added on the San U San Luis unit. And then 68, we added the San Felipe unit. And finally, our la a last large construction was 1979 with New Maloney's Dam. And that's basically the last time we had a very large pro uh, uh, construction project. Um, we did construct the Inner Thai Canal in uh, 2011, and that's a small canal that uh, ties our canals with the state canals. But uh, 79 was kind of the last big piece of infrastructure. Next slide. Great, so if we have kind of a quick overview of our major dams. So we have Shasta Dam located up uh, north of Reading, and it's our largest dam. We kind of consider it our, our Keystone Dam. Uh, it's the largest dam in California. It operates for flood control primarily uh, um, in those wetter years, uh, water supplies, temperature management, power generation, and water quality benefits. And we'll talk a little bit about what those look like in a few slides. It's about uh, four and a half million acre feet and I think I already said it is the largest in California. Next slide. So then we have our uh, Trinity Reservoir, which, uh, which is much smaller than Shasta at only 2.4 million acre feet. It's up near uh, Weaverville within the Klamath River Basin on the Trinity River. Um, it functions for a uh, similar water supply in the Sacramento River system, regulatory requirements in both the Sacramento and Klamath systems and hydropower. If we say that Shasta is our keystone facility for, uh, for water supply within, uh, within our project, then Trinity would be the keystone facility for power. And we'll talk about that uh, in, a few, in a few slides. I've got a, a, a graphic that shows why that is. Next slide. Okay, then we have Folsom. So uh, Folsom's not our smallest reservoir, uh, Fryant is, uh, which is uh, about half the size, but, but Folsom is a much smaller reservoir and a much larger watershed. So it's, uh, it's less than a million acre feet and the average inflow in that watershed is about three to four million acre feet. So it's got a very high potential of filling, which means we rely on it a lot for meeting various demands throughout the system. Uh, it's also located on the American River up near Sacramento. Sacramento is uh, has a very high flood risk and there's a lot of flood uh, infrastructure challenges around Sacramento. So it's a key piece of that system as well. Um, and it provides for flood control, water supplies, temperature management, power generation, and water quality benefits similar to Shasta. Um, basically Shasta and Folsom and, and to some degree Trinity are all operated kind of in, a, um, in an integrated fashion together to try to meet various objectives uh, within the system. Next slide. And then we have our last dam uh, uh, from, uh, that was constructed, uh, New Maloney's. Um, if, if Folsom is a small dam on a large watershed, New Maloney's is the opposite. It is a very large dam on a very small watershed. So it's about 2.4 million acre feet, but the average inflow to this reservoir is about one to 1 1.2 million acre feet. So uh, the reservoir is uh, double the size of the average inflow, meaning it has a very low refill potential. 
Um, it's out about 40 miles east of Stockton, and it provides water for fishery requirements, water quality, water rights, uh, and, uh, and agricultural, municipal, and industrial water needs. Next slide. And then we have Fryant, our smallest reservoir at uh, right around a half a million acre feet. It's over near Fresno uh, and it operates to divert waters into two very large canals within to deliver water in the San Joaquin Valley. And it also operates for the San Joaquin River Restoration Program. Next slide. Okay, then we have San Luis. San Luis is a, a, an off-stream reservoir, meaning we pump up into it, so it doesn't have much natural inflow. Uh, and, and this stores water that's pumped out of the, the Bay Delta area. Uh, we constructed this jointly with the state of California and we operate it jointly with the state of California. Uh, the federal portion mainly supplies water to uh, the western portion of the Central Valley, and that's primarily for agriculture, but also for some municipal and industrial and refuge supplies. Next slide. So Tracy pumping plant is what gets that water up there, um, although not, not directly. Uh, so uh, this is a, a very large pumping plant that moves the water about 200 feet up into the Delta Mendota Canal, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, right, it has a license to pump about 4,600 CFS. However, uh, as we talked about the challenge of aging infrastructure, subsidence has caused those canals to sink uh, and, and given us some major challenges with ever getting up to that amount. Uh, right now, we're probably closer to 4,200 is a max, although we are working on, on efforts to try to, uh, to maintain those facilities and get them get the capacity back. Uh, next slide. And then we have the Delta Mendota Canal, which I, which I just mentioned. And so this carries water from the Jones pumping plant in the Delta all the way down to the Mendota pool with a stop off at San Luis Dam uh, to, to be able to put water up into that dam. And, uh, and I think you can see on the map, it runs uh, down in the Central Valley. Next slide. Okay, so I talked briefly about how if Shasta is the, the keystone of the water supply, then Trinity is the keystone of power. And this is a graphic to, to show you why. So we often think about power in our project as ancillary to water supply. So that means when we release water for water, not just water supply, for, but for any water demand. So when we release, release water for water supply or to meet a regulation or to meet a, a, a fish requirement or, or, or some other purpose, um, uh, then, then we produce power off of whatever was released. Um, and as you can see in here, uh, Trinity, um, and so hopefully it's uh, the, the larger the drop, the more power you're going to produce for every drop. So Trinity, as you can see, is drops almost 2,500 feet uh, into, into the Sacramento River. It's about a, a 2,000 foot drop just from the dam to Keswick, and it passes through four power plants. It goes through the Trinity power plant, through the Carr power plant, Spring Creek power plant, and then it's not on here, but then it finally through the Keswick power plant. So it, it, it generates quite a bit of power for a single drop of water, as where some of our other facilities only go through one or maybe two facilities, and it's a much smaller drop. So that's why we say Trinity is really the kind of the keystone of our power operation throughout the Central Valley project. Next slide. Okay, so when we talk about challenges, uh, which is a great question, what are the challenges that we're experiencing? A lot of them just stem from the, how the Central Valley habitat has been modified. So we have dams throughout the system, uh, some for the Central Valley project, but also uh, local supplier, uh, uh, local water systems and whole slew of different owners uh, that are all around the rim of the valley floor and they're isolating salmon from their historical habitats. So where salmon normally could go up into a stream, go all the way up through the foothills, up into the Sierra Nevada, reach some nice cold water and, and spawn and, and rear there, they can't make it there anymore, right? There's a dam there, so they can only go up it so far. And, and that creates a lot of challenges for them because now their habitat is not only limited, but it's also significantly warmer. Um, so that's a that's a huge challenge uh, for both the fish and for us as operators. We are often trying to operate our facilities to try to mimic some of those temperatures so they can have a chance of uh, of, of completing their life cycle. Um, we also have uh, levees that are throughout the system uh, that isolate the fish from their historical floodplain habitat, so they can't get into the same areas in the valley that they used to be able to get into maybe several hundred years ago. 
Then we have diversions throughout the entire system. Uh, some some are, are associated with our contractors, but they're really throughout the entire system that are pulling water and can impair uh, their how the fish are moving and where they're going to, especially when they're much smaller. Uh, and then finally, we have the large export facilities in the Delta, uh, and John will talk about this a little bit more as well. Uh, and they they really are altering the hydrodynamics of the Delta, which, uh, which I'll talk about in, I think, the next slide. So next slide. Okay, so then we get to the Delta. So the Delta is where the Sacramento River is coming in from the north, and the San Joaquin River is coming in from the south. Uh, they are two major rivers, but a significant amount more water is coming in from the Sacramento uh, on average than is coming in from the San Joaquin. And those two rivers meet in the Delta, and then they push out toward, towards the Golden Gate Bridge to what we call Delta outflow. So the water leaving, uh, leaving the Delta uh, past the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, one of the primary uh, functions of both the Central Valley and the uh, and state water projects are salinity management. Basically, as the tides come in, that ocean water from the from the Pacific Ocean is trying to push into the delta, and the projects are trying to release enough water to push that water out to keep to keep that salinity out to closer to the Golden Gate Bridge. And, and we do that so that the water is usable within the Delta uh, where our pumps are, where there's other diversions at, where the parts of our projects are, where there's a number of other projects and, uh, and uh, urban users um, and, and other uh, agricultural users throughout the system. So that's a big piece of what we do. We also use the Delta cross channel gate, uh, which is a, a gate that we developed, I wanna say in the forties, uh, which takes water from could be off a decade, um, which takes water, fresh water from the Sacramento River and puts it into the interior delta. So it freshens up that area of the delta so we don't get uh, areas of real high salty, high salty water. And then we have old and middle rivers, uh, which are the kind of the two channels that, uh, that, that lead to our pumping facilities. Um, this, this whole delta is a very tidal sloshing system and John will touch on this. It kind of moves back and forth. When we have those uh, pumps turning on and we have a, a high amount of um, flow going into those pumps, then the old and middle rivers tend to start flowing in a reverse direction. So, uh, so they start going down towards the pump instead of that sloshing or like what we see in the wintertime instead of that um, positive uh, flow out towards the ocean. So that can cause a lot of confusion for the fish who are trying to get to their returning stream or who are trying to get out to the delta. So we have limitations on how reverse that flow can be to try to limit that impact to those fish. Um, and that doesn't always work. Uh, so we also we, uh, can have salvage uh, before the pumping plants. Um, so those uh, basically fish that got into the old middle river channels and made it to our facilities and we collect those and take them out to a place where uh, we hope they'll have a better chance of either getting to where they were going or getting out to the ocean. And then finally, I think I already mentioned, we have facility limitation uh, with our aging infrastructure, which is always causing new, <laughs> new challenges uh, uh, by the day. Next slide. Okay, so, uh, so we talk about water supply. Uh, water supply is a big part of what the Central Valley Project was constructed for. Um, when we think about it, we have two uh, kind of distinct areas. One is uh, how we deliver water to the people we're, that were here before us. So when we came in, we said uh, we would like a water right permit so that we can uh, so we can develop this project. And there were already a number of people using water off of the same system that we were proposing to dam. And so the state water board said, okay, but if you want that permit, you need to go settle with these people who were already using that water and figure out how you're gonna satisfy their, their rights before you get your rights. And so that's quite a large amount for this, for the federal, for the Central Valley project side. That's about 4 million acre feet or 55% of our total contracts. Uh, and we think about those in two, kind of major areas, although there's a lot more of them, but uh, two major areas are the Sacramento River settlement contractors up north, uh, and then we have the exchange contractors down south. Uh, basically, the settlement contractors are where we developed a contract to settle how we would meet their water rights from the Sacramento River once we constructed and operated Shasta Dam, as where the exchange contractors, we developed an agreement to exchange the water that they were getting from the same. <clears throat> from the San Joaquin River to instead come from our Jones pumping plant that we constructed in the Delta. So they would get water from the Delta in exchange for water from the, from the San Joaquin. 
The other area of, of water supply is the, is the water that we deliver because of the project. So we're not, this is, we have developed this water and now we're delivering it um, uh, to the people who have contracted with us after we build our project. And so that's about 45% of the total. And that's uh, kind of developed by region. So we have north of Delta, American River, what we call East Side, which is also New Maloney's or Stanislaus has a number of different names. Um, and then we have Friant, South of Delta and in Delta. So those are different types of contractors. Next slide. Okay, so how do we determine what the allocation, and this is an allocation primarily for that second category, because the second category is, uh, is after we've met those senior water rights. So uh, for the settlement and exchange. So how do we, once we've met them, how do we determine our allocation? And this is kind of a, a big picture view of the, what the process looks like. We take all of our conditions that we know, right? So we know where the reservoirs are at now. We know what the seasonal forecast is for, for how much runoff we should get in the future. Uh, we've got other project inputs. What are other projects doing? How are they operating? What do we think the demands are going to be? What are those estimated minimum river flows? What do we think the requirements are going to be uh, to keep in the river? And then what are the requirements going to be in the delta and how much water needs to be released to meet those? And then we have what we know we want to get out of that, which is the river, the forecast of river releases, storages, exports, and exports means pumping in the delta, and then the uh, operations in San Luis. Uh, and then we iterate. So we take all of those and we iterate uh, amongst a, a variety of goals. So those goals look like maximizing those deliveries while meeting uh, reasonable upstream carryover storage, fishery requirements, water quality requirements, minimizing excess conditions. Excess basically means that there's water that's going out past the Golden Gate Bridge that doesn't have a designated purpose. So that's an excess water, try to minimize that, uh, minimize our flood control encroachment because we don't want to uh, have reservoirs that are too high that then cause us to have uh, huge releases once a storm comes in that then causes major downstream impacts. Um, we want to meet our share of the requirements. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we do that. And I think John will touch on this as well. Uh, and then we want to minimize San Luis carryover storage. So while the upstream reservoirs, we want to have a reasonable carryover storage uh, to, to protect against what future water supply might look like. For San Luis, it's an off-stream reservoir, so we only pump water into it. So we want to maximize that use where it can, it can ideally fill in the spring and then pull all the way down by the maximum demand period, usually sometime around August or September. And from that, we get estimated water supply allocations. Next slide. So we have a number of various operating agreements. This is not an all-inclusive list. It's just a, a sample of kind of some of the big ones. Um, so we, I'll start with the, uh, with the first four. That's our state water right permit. So that's uh, uh, primarily dictating what kind of requirements we need to meet in the Delta. It regulates how far out we need to push that, that ocean water and then how much water needs to be flowing up past Golden Gate Bridge among a, a slew of other requirements. We also have uh, our biological opinions from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Those uh, are uh, how we operate in order to protect endangered species. Um, and then DWR has the uh, CDFW incidental take permit, which I think John will talk about in a minute. And so we have a number of requirements that we're meeting, and there are more than that. <laughs> Those are kind of the, the, the big four. Uh, and then we have a coordinated operations agreement between uh, Reclamation and DWR on how we're going to meet things that are common to both projects. So for example, we're both using the Sacramento River. We're both meeting, we have a requirement to meet a delta outflow. So how are we going to make sure that that delta outflow or that salinity barrier is maintained? So we have an agreement that defines how that's shared. We also have a number of, uh, of laws, such as Central Valley Project Improvement Act and the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act that, that has uh, um, requirements for our, uh, for our projects. One of the big ones that came out of CVPIA, uh, I just realized the project word is missing out of that. It's supposed to be Central Valley Project Improvement Act. I apologize. Um, uh, one of the components of that uh, came out of uh, required deliveries to wildlife refuges. Uh, so that was passed in 1992, and uh, that was a re that's a requirement that we have that, um, uh, that to meet those demands both north and south of the delta. 
Uh, we also have a number of, of agreements, such as between the Army Corps and, uh, and CDFW and uh, the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and, and a whole slew of other acts um, in addition to our supply contracts and agreements. Um, so quite, quite a number of things that we're looking at on a regular basis to make, sh making sure, to make sure that, we're, uh, that we're meeting our requirements. Next slide. So uh, this is not meant to be read, but just an example. Uh, this is These are our state permit requirements and it's January through December. And so the intent of this slide is to show you that every month has some requirement that needs to be met. So this is what we're looking at on a very regular basis is what is the requirement? Um, there's a whole slew of footnotes in here that modify some of the requirements. Um, so taking, taking into account those and, uh, and where are we at and where do we think we're going? Next slide. And then similarly, this is a slide, and I apologize, this one is October through September, and this is for our uh, for Endangered Species Act protection. Uh, these are our, is the operations that are included in the biological opinions. Again, you can see that there is something in every single month, so, uh, so there are um, constant um, uh, requirements that we're, that we're watching, monitoring, and meeting. Next slide. Okay, so coordinating is a big part of what we do. Uh, we coordinate uh, probably most with the Department of Water Resources as the project operator, since we are sharing the river systems and we're sharing the regulations. And um, we're also coordinating heavily with the uh, State Water Resources Control Board, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, State uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the National Marine Fisheries Services as regulators. So they are all uh, uh, they provide us permits so that we can operate. So we're constantly working with them on how we're meeting the um, objectives of the permit. We also coordinate heavily with the Army Corps, who is both a project operator and a regulator. They operate facilities that affect our facilities, such as Pine Flat Dam, which under certain conditions can actually flow into our system and make it to the Delta. Um, they are also a regulator as the uh, manager of our flood control um, uh, limitations, so constantly working with them. And then we uh, also work a lot with the Western Area Power Administration, who actually used to be a part of the Bureau of Reclamation a number of years ago. Um, they split off and now their, uh, their role is to uh, uh, the transmission of our power and the marketing of the power produced by the Bureau of Reclamation. And then of course we coordinate heavily with uh, a number of local system operators and various stakeholders such as Delta Stewardship Council. Next slide. Okay, so uh, typical operations planning schedule. So this is not meant to be a, a, a full list, but just kind of an example. We're looking at things on a monthly, weekly, and daily basis. So monthly, uh, which is, um, uh, we're looking at it monthly, but each month we're looking at it uh, seasonally. So we're looking at a seasonal runoff forecast with both short-term and long-term forecast. And that leads into an operational forecast, which says, what do we think the next 12 months is gonna look like looking out from here? Um, and then we also have watershed technical team meetings that are monthly and we discuss operations and fishery conditions and make adjustments to operations based on what those fishery conditions are. We have weekly coordination, uh, which is uh, looks like the salmon and smelt technical teams that meet weekly on operations of fishery conditions, very similar to the monthly ones. These just meet weekly, but they're looking uh, more closely at the fishery conditions, looking at the monitoring sites, looking at uh, uh, various uh, inputs and and um, uh, information they have and making adjustments to operations based on that. Then uh, we are uh, regularly reviewing our regulations and agreements, kind of looking at those bars and seeing if there's anything new that uh, is coming up based on the conditions. And then we're forecasting our changes to the operations about three to five days out. Um, and that's so that we can, uh, as I mentioned, we produce more power than, than what we use. So we, we try to schedule those changes three to five days out so that we have an accurate depiction of what power we're not using so that we can then sell that power or that WAPA can sell that power. Uh, then we've got uh, daily operations. So every single day, the operators are discussing current conditions. They're making adjustments as needed based on what we've seen. And we're coordinating with the state water project operators. Uh, we're actually, um, although we're all working virtually or, or uh, many of us are working virtually now, um, uh, we are co-housed uh, in the same building with the state water project operators. And then finally, I just have uh, our allocations. Our initial allocation is in February uh, and we typically do uh, updates as needed March through June. I think I have seen them come out as late as September um, uh, for changes for significantly changing conditions, but it's typically March through June. 
And I think that's a quick overview. Uh, next slide. Yep. So I can take any uh, CVP focused uh, questions if there if there are any, or we can uh, for more broad big picture. Probably best to wait for um, for John Lehigh's presentation. Either on mute. Kristen, I have a question about siltation of reservoirs. Um, I was reading an article recently about, uh, and I think they were describing primarily eastern reservoirs and maybe reservoirs in Colorado. But is, is that much of an issue in California with the reservoirs filling up with sediment? Yeah, it, it, it can be. Um, so a lot of our reservoirs have other reservoirs upstream of them. Um, so we get a little bit less of it at, at our bigger reservoirs. Um, but we are still monitoring that and doing regular bathymetric surveys to look for it. Just as an example, um, Folsom Dam is about, I think it's a little under a million acre feet. So about 977,000 acre feet was it's constructed. I think our last survey found that in the first 50 years of operation, it had, it had uh, accumulated about 10,000 acre feet of sediment. So that gives you an indication of kind of where the issue is. But Folsom has a number of upstream reservoirs to it. So, uh, so I think uh, the, those upstream reservoirs might have a different, <laughs> a different opinion on, on how much of a factor that is. So folks, I think we're gonna hold questions till after the next speaker, and then we'll open it up for, uh, for both speakers. Um, so the next speaker is uh, John Lehigh from uh, DWR. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen, or attempt to share my screen here. Uh, can everyone see that okay? Oops. Yep. yep, should be able to see it. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I welcome the opportunity to be able to uh, help give you an overview of the, the State Water Project. Um, again, my name is John Lehigh. I am the um, Deputy Division uh, Manager for um, uh, Water Operations for the State Water Project. Um, and um, I hope that my presentation here is uh, fairly complementary to uh, Kristen White's. Uh, there is a lot of similarities I think that you'll find between the, the two projects. Um, if uh, you know if Central Valley Project was late to the game, then uh, State Water Project is really late to the game. Um, it was mostly constructed. Uh, the contracts, original water supply contracts, signed in the 1960s. Um, so um, let me go ahead and, and uh, give you an overview of what I plan to present here in my presentation. Um, I will start with uh, sort of the, the, the premise behind, as Kristen had indicated, um, the, the reason for the projects, uh, uh, overview of California's very unique uh, hydrology. Uh, then I'll get into some of the facilities of the State Water Project. Um, operational challenges. I'm going to focus, um, although uh, many of the same items that were on Kristen's list uh, are applicable to the State Water Project, I'm going to focus on two major ones in particular, which is the variable hydrology and uh, delta constraints. Um, and then I'm going to go over the State Water Project's uh, allocation process as well. So uh, just to back up and um, Similar information as what uh, Kristen provided, uh, but uh, for those of you that maybe are not uh, native to California, um, it is uh, there is a very distinct difference between where much of the rain and snow falls in the state, uh, the northern uh, two thirds or uh, uh, half of the state, um, and where most of the population centers are, which are not only in Southern California, but uh, you could also uh, talk about uh, much of the Bay Area as well is, uh, is uh, south of the Delta, which is kind of the key uh, hub of the water supply system in the state. Um, the, so there is the uh, geographic uh, disparity, and then there is the seasonal disparity between when most of the precipitation falls, which is, which is in the winter months, uh, uh, primarily December through March, 
Um, and uh, like Kristen, Kristen was saying, we get very little precip. Uh, we're relying on snowpack uh, melt uh, for the late spring into the early summer. Um, and uh, the demand is actually just the reverse, as you would expect uh, during the summer months, we would see the peak uh, demand on the system. So uh, really it's about the, the pumps and the canals of, of really both projects are, are there to remedy this geographic disparity uh, between where the water supply is and uh, where most of the demand is. Um, in terms of the disparity, the temporal disparity, uh, the reservoirs remedy that in terms of capturing the direct runoff and the snow melt in the winter and the spring, and then releasing that later uh, during the higher demand periods. So just a, an overview of the, uh, the scope of the state water project. Um, our primary uh, water supply reservoir and also serves a major flood control uh, purpose is Lake Oroville um, in the north part of the state, uh, feeds the Feather River, uh, confluence here with the Sacramento River uh, and the Yuba River, um, as far as uh, releasing water into the Delta, the Sam Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Uh, Clifton Court Four Bay is, is uh, our primary diversion uh, point for most of the water for the State Water Project. There is a, a smaller diversion point um, at Barker Slough um, in the north part of the Delta that does uh, supply water to uh, Solano and Napa counties. Um, we also have a South Bay Aqueduct that provides uh, water to uh, Santa Clara and Alameda counties. Um, and then much of the water is also, uh, this is the San Luis Reservoir that Kristen referred to earlier. It's in purple here because it is a joint use facility. Um, and uh, so a Approximately a little over half that uh, reservoir uh, is for state water project storage and um, the other half for Central Valley project storage. Um, there is a San Luis Canal, uh, which is one reach of the California Aqueduct uh, on which the deliveries are really to uh, Central Valley project customers. Uh, so again, in purple, this is a joint use facility between the two uh, projects. Um, at the end of the San Luis Canal, then it, it's all state water project for the most part, um, deliveries at that point. Um, and uh, we have a number of branches. Um, and although the major, most of the major facilities were uh, constructed in the 1960s, uh, we, the, the project is, is continuing to add on to some of its facilities. Uh, so for example, the coastal branch, which services uh, Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, uh, was constructed in the 1990s. Um, as you go further south, uh, we have a couple of branches here, the East Branch and the West Branch into Southern California, uh, the Inland Empire. Um, there are an extension of the East Branch uh, was actually not completed until into the 2000s. So it's, it's, it's been a work in progress in a lot of respects. Uh, so, Multi-purpose project, um, and what are the prim those primary purposes? Um, and we can actually represent all of the purposes here just with a, lake at, a look at Lake Oroville itself. Uh, is uh, you know water supply, uh, flood control are probably the two biggest uh, purposes for the project. Specifically, Lake Oroville. Uh, there was a federal investment in the in the. Oroville project uh, for flood control purposes um, and uh, cost share with the state water project on which uh, that purpose is for water supply. Um, also uh, fish and wildlife uh, preservation and enhancement, hydropower and uh, California uh, uh, power grid support and public recreation. So, you add up some of the facilities um, altogether, we do have uh, over 30 storage facilities. Uh, Oroville and San Luis um, are the, by far the two largest of those storage facilities. Uh, there are 29 pumps and generating plants. Uh, some, some of the plants serve as both 
uh, pumping and generation. Um, and we have over 700 miles of, of canals and pipelines. So here's a, here's a profile of the State Water Project um, down here below, uh, similar to, to the one that uh, Kristen uh, provided for the Central Valley Project. And this also uh, gives you a feel for one of the big differences between the two projects um, in terms of the power production. I think Kristen mentioned that the Central Valley Project is a net power uh, generator. Uh, State Water Project is just the opposite. We're a net uh, power consumer. And uh, the profile is kind of what gives that away. Um, uh, you know, our major, our major power facilities are from Lake Oroville. Um, there's a significant amount of capacity of releases from the, uh, the Oroville complex, which includes uh, three different uh, generating plants. Um, but as you can see, the head difference is not that great in terms of the elevation that we're releasing the water. But it is a significant uh, generating facility. Um, and then the releases into the Delta area here. Uh, then we have a series of pumping plants uh, to uh, provide water to, for various customers. Uh, we have a, quite a lift here to get over the coastal range to the coastal branch to, again, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Um, and then a very large uh, lift of over 3,000 feet um, over the Tehachapi range here into the LA basin. Um, and so it takes an enormous amount of, of, of power to lift the volumes of water that um, are uh, provided to um, uh, many of our, our, our customers down in um, Southern California. There are a number of recovery generating plants that do partially recover some of that energy that took to uh, lift the water over the Tehachapis and uh, through the use of timing and um, uh, really, do, you know, the, the a lot of the we have a lot of regulating reservoirs that 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 help uh, pro provide the opportunity to pump when power is the cheap is cheaper and uh, generate when power is uh, most in need. So um, that's that's uh, an opportunity to offset some of those costs uh, of lifting that water over the Tehachapi's. Um, So the, I'll talk a little bit more about the Oroville complex. Uh, again, it is the main uh, reservoir, it's water supply reservoir for the State Water Project. Uh, holds 3.5 million acre feet. Um, incidentally, um, I believe Kristen mentioned that the American Basin, uh, the inflow is a little over 4 million acre feet on, a, on, on average per year. Um, that's about the same as the feather. It's a, probably a little bit larger than the American, but the, the reservoir itself is three and a half times the size of Folsom. So that gives you a feel for uh, what she was talking about in terms of watershed and size of reservoir. Um, uh, Orville Dam uh, is an earth-filled dam um, with a concrete core. It is 770 feet high. It is the tallest dam in the United States. Uh, even larger than Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam look, probably looks uh, a little bit more spectacular uh, in the given it's a concrete arch dam, but um, believe it or not, uh, Oroville Dam is actually a higher, uh, taller dam than uh, Hoover. Um, gated spillway, a um, uh, little under 300,000 CFS capacity. Uh, typically though, uh, we would be releasing uh, per our flood control rules, which should be something uh, shy of 150,000 CFS. Um, largest, uh, it is the largest uh, hydropower plant in uh, the entire portfolio for the State Water Project, um, a little under 900 megawatts. The, one of the other major facilities I'm gonna highlight here is that Edmonston uh, pumping plant that I was talking about earlier, where it's the highest uh, pump lift in the world. Um, as far as I know, I think that is still true, um, but it's a little it's a little shy of 2,000 foot lift on just that one from that one pump. Um, it, and it's a significant amount of water uh, that is can be pumped by this plant. Um, as you can see, 4,400 CFS, um, which is a uh, 
it, it's really, it would consider that a river of, of water that it, we're able to pump over the Tehachapis. Um, it has 14, uh, 80,000 horsepower, 60 megawatt uh, pumps. Um, total load on that plant, uh, 840 megawatts. So um, to put that in perspective, um, you know, that's, that's almost as, as high as what uh, Oroville uh, complex can generate in terms of power is the same amount of power uh, that at full load, uh, the Edmonston pump would be uh, utilizing to pump over the Tehachapi's. Um, and yeah, it is, it is the largest uh, uh, contributor to the pump load for the project. Um, so here are the, back in the, uh, the 60s, as I had indicated, um, is when the project, uh, we did uh, enter into contracts, water supply contracts with 29 different water supply districts and agencies throughout the state. Uh, this shows you where they are geographically. There are a couple locally up here at, um, near Lake Oroville. Um, and uh, the state water project is primarily uh, urban based uh, water users. Um, there is a significant uh, agricultural use in Kern County. Um, and, uh, but other than, than that, uh, most of the water is to urban contractors. And you can see the entire list here. I had mentioned North Bay, South Bay, uh, the San Francisco Bay area, and um, many of the areas uh, in the LA basin all the way to San Diego. Um, and uh, the Inland Empire. This gives you a feel for uh, the volumes of those contracts and uh, where uh, the water is delivered. So um, the, the largest contractor is Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. So just under half of the entire what's table A supply. So that's the total a uh, little over 4 million acre feet of contracted supply from the state water project. Um, the second largest user is agriculture, is the, also the largest agricultural user, Kern County Water Agency, about a quarter of the uh, contracts. Um, and then you can see some of the other um, more significant uh, urban areas here. Um, and then the other, the rest of the 29. So here's the, the pie that shows um, in the lower right-hand corner here, uh, that about a quarter is from ag contractors and the other three quarters for MI contractors. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, that entire list that Kristen has certainly applies to State Water Project as well in terms of aging and infrastructure and subsidence and those types of issues. Um, but I'm going to focus on a couple here, starting with the variable hydrology. So um, Besides the uh, kind of the seasonal disparity in, in the precipitation in the state, uh, which is a constant, um, what we really have a, a large variability in terms of the annual water supply that we see in the state. And in fact, we have the most varied water supply of any uh, state in the, in the country. So um, the, uh, if you look here, this is the uh, fraction of the uh, standard deviation over the, the mean annual precipitation. So um, out east, uh, pretty much see the same amount of precipitation every year. Um, it starts to get more varied as you move west. And uh, California, uh, Northern California, quite varied. And Southern California, even more varied. And, and really the reason for that is that we really rely on just a few storms each year that provide the bulk of our water supply. Um, we now refer to those as, as atmospheric rivers. Um, and it's just a few of these storms each year. Um, uh, here's the number of days per year that we would receive uh, about half of our precipitation. Um, and um, as you can see, that's, that's uh, only a, a handful of days, uh, 10 to 15, where we leave, receive half of the precipitation for Northern California. This is uh, a, a look at the annual runoff um, as observed over the last 100 years for both the Sacramento Valley and the San Joaquin Valley. Um, there is a uh, classification 
uh, through the uh, State Water Board uh, has established. Uh, in terms of classifying it each year, in terms of its runoff, um, in terms of five categories, wet, above normal, below normal, dry, or critically dry. And so you can, you can see the distribution over, over the years and, and, and the variability shows up here in this, um, in this graphic for both the Sacramento and the San Joaquin. Um, although there's usually a pretty good uh, correlation between uh, the year types between the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, there are, there are a few years that uh, you do see some differences. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit later how the significance of these standard of these year types is uh, related to uh, what sorts of water quality standards the two projects are required to meet. This is just another, uh, this is another graphic to kind of show that annual variability. Uh, so we've got in blue here, um, highest inflow 1983, uh, lowest 1977, and kind of the average in green here. Um, and so you can see in addition to the uh, seasonal variation on the runoff, uh, March generally our highest runoff month because of a combination of direct rain and uh, melting snow. Um, but then you can see the orders of magnitude difference between a dry year and a very wet year. So uh, flood control requirements, <clears throat> one of the things we're, we're only seeing uh, increase in that variation. That's one of the things with a warming uh, climate is uh, we're also seeing much more disparity between what's already a, uh, a challenge in terms of the variability. Um, and one of the areas where that variability and that challenge exists is in the uh, flood control requirements at the reservoirs. Um, every major reservoir in the state has some sort of uh, required flood control space to um, provide vacant space in the, in the wintertime when we would expect most of these atmospheric rivers to hit the, uh, hit the basins. Uh, so we want to be able to absorb those uh, large inflow events and uh, release the water at a slower rate that fits within the, uh, the channel, the levied uh, channels downstream. Um, and uh, the graphic here is just showing um, in some of the reservoirs, this uh, required space um, top of conservation varies through the year. And for Oroville, it's based on the amount of how wet the, the uh, watershed is. Uh, the wetter the watershed, the more space we need to provide uh, because that, that assumes that we would see larger uh, inflow into the reservoir given the same amount of precip. So we need to provide additional space. Uh, so this is, you know, this is the big dynamic at play between uh, two purposes, uh, flood control and water supply. Um, there's, so there is a need to really um, understand the dynamics of these atmospheric rivers and be able to forecast them better because this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of the trade-offs between water supply and flood, flood protection. Um, so there's significant efforts um, up and down the state. Um, just within the last couple of years, uh, state, state Water Project has uh, partnered with Yuba Water Agency uh, both, uh, uh, both of these agencies are responsible for meeting common downstream control points on the Feather River. The Yuba is a major uh, downstream uh, tributary to the Feather River. Um, and so we've entered into a partnership with Yuba Water Agency, along with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, NIMS, the uh, Sonoma Water. Uh, the reason Sonoma Water is involved is they have um, they were one of the, uh, the uh, trailblazers in terms of the forecast and foreign reservoir operations or FIRO uh, as it relates to Lake Mendocino. And uh, they're part of our steering committee in terms of helping to provide uh, input and uh, kind of lessons learned from their process. Uh, but the, so there's kind of twofold, um, uh, twofold uh, purposes for this FIRO program. One is to uh, invest in uh, improvements in um, weather forecasting and runoff forecasting into the reservoirs, and also uh, look at uh, ways that we could leverage uh, increased um, capabilities and skill levels of the forecasting um, as it relates to those flood control rules for both New Bullard's Bar on the Yuba River and um, 
the for Lake Oroville, you know, on the Feather River. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit to the other uh, major challenge that I identified, which uh, was the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Um, I think all of you are uh, familiar with the Delta. It is it is the hub of the water system in the state where the Sacramento and the San Joaquin Rivers uh, join before uh, going out to the Bay. Uh, of course, it also is the largest estuary um, on the west coast of, of both Americas. Um, so inherent in that water supply and fishery habitat, um, there it's inherent that there would be challenges in trying to manage both of those systems. Um, this is, um, um, to give you an overview, and I think Kristen had, had indicated, um, one of the, it's a very complex uh, hydrodynamics in the Delta. Um, this is this this is a city to get you oriented. City of Sacramento is right about right about here, um, and uh, up until that point, it's really a rivering uh, a system, uh, river flowing downhill. Uh, once you enter the delta channels here, uh, we enter a tidal uh, uh, tidal system uh, where we see uh, reverse flows uh, every tw twice a day. Uh, so this would be uh, flood and ebb, ebb tides that we see uh, throughout the Delta channels. Um, this will give you an idea of the magnitude of these, these shifts. I mean, it's enormous uh, tidal flux here uh, in Sassoon uh, Bay area. Uh, you can see over 300,000 CFS of, of reversing flows um, forward and back, uh, sloshing back and forth uh, twice per day on the ebb and, and uh, flood tides. Um, still significant um, tidal variation, even quite a ways uh, into, into the Delta Channel system. Um, overlaid on, I don't have a slide on this, but this is just talking about the, uh, the ebb, and, ebb and flood tides that are twice per day, but there's also a, a monthly variation, which is uh, the spring and neap tidal cycles. So um, there is a uh, approximately six to seven days of uh, building towards a spring tide with, where the average uh, stage in the delta increases uh, by a foot or so, um, followed by about seven days of the slow draining of the delta on average. Um, and that cycle repeats again twice per month. So that's kind of overlaid on top of this daily variation. And <clears throat> with, these, with these tidal variations, you also see the movement of salt. From, uh, from the ocean, uh, works its way into these delta channels. So in and out with the flows is in and out with the, uh, with the salt as well. Um, and it also, you know, there's a big, um, it also has a large effect on the, you know, this is the, the tidal uh, estuary that uh, the many listed, both state and federal listed species are, um, have as habitat. So the, um, I think Kristen had mentioned this as well. So uh, kind of mission one of the releases from the projects, um, and this is primarily, this is in the summertime. This is a, a pre-project, post-project, look at the Delta and the Delta channels. Um, prior to the construction of the projects, the major reservoirs upstream, uh, there would be salinity intrusion in, far into the Delta. Um, into the Delta channels in, in, in drier years. Um, in, in order for there to be a, a, a reliable supply, <clears throat> continuous supply to uh, both the users within the Delta and the uh, major uh, intakes for the two uh, Central Valley Project and State Water Project in the South Delta, job one is to provide a hydrologic barrier to provide a freshwater corridor uh, through the channels that, that uh, Kristen had mentioned earlier, through the cross channel, uh, down through some of the channels in the Central Delta and then Old and Middle River uh, towards the pumping facilities here in the South Delta. Um, so um, that's also related to the standards that we have to meet um, as part of our, our water rights with the State Water Resource Control Board. So <clears throat> these are the two major buckets for the regulations, the Delta regulations. One is 
uh, the uh, water quality control plan objectives. Um, they're really divided uh, currently. Uh, there's three major purposes, uh, municipal, industrial, agricultural, and for fish and wildlife. Um, and these, these regulations are, are fairly prescriptive in nature in terms of, uh, it's kind of a cookbook, a lookup table, given a year type in a month, here X is the amount of outflow that's required or the amount of salinity level that is, that is uh, required at certain uh, locations throughout the Delta. Um, there is also uh, the second major bucket is state and federal environmental species act um, protections. And um, these are, uh, although there are certain triggers, um, ecological uh, triggers for, for actions that fall under this umbrella, um, it's, it's much more um, uh, based on monitoring rather than a, a fixed uh, prescriptive uh, reduction. So uh, what you know, much of the actions are based on a range of flow targets uh, and uh, this will be informed by real-time observations uh, within the Delta, both fishery and non-fishery type um, of uh, data that is uh, constantly being monitored. And so here are the, <clears throat> there are telemeter monitoring stations, uh, just a, a sample of some of these. Uh, these are the flow and salinity uh, monitoring stations that can be accessed um, by the public through uh, the California uh, Data Exchange, uh, CDEC. Um, many of these are, you can see, are uh, maintained by either DWR or, excuse me, um, uh, reclamation, and uh, there are a few from the USGS as well. And um, so this is this is primarily the flow and salinity monitoring that, that goes on. And then there's also uh, a number of fishery monitoring um, programs through um, uh, Kodiak Trawl, um, other uh, special monitoring efforts that help uh, manage to the uh, biological opinions and the uh, incidental take permit. So <clears throat> talking a little bit more about this, this should look familiar. This is the, um, oops, this is the set of, uh, of standards for the, uh, from the water board. Again, it's divided into fish and wildlife, uh, M&I, ag, and fish and wildlife as it relates to water quality. So flow and water quality standards. Uh, and then this also should look familiar. This is the, um, based on the, uh, most recent biological opinions that uh, affect the long-term operations of both uh, Central Valley Project and State Water Project. Um, and uh, this is from the, the most recent biological opinions in 2019. So I won't, <clears throat> just wanted to emphasize that that's, both projects are responsible to meet those uh, requirements. This, uh, this third chart I have here, this is from uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, this is the incidental take permit. So this is um, the requirements on the State Water Project uh, based on CESA, um, so California Endangered Species Act. Um, these are requirements. Um, there is a significant overlap, uh, I would say with the biological opinions. There are some differences um, uh, between the two, uh, the, the biological opinions and the ITP, but for the most part, uh, we're protecting uh, the same species during the same life stages, uh, during the same months. Um, there are a few um, additional actions uh, on their ITP. Um, there are some summer actions uh, for Sassoon gate operations that are found in the biops, uh, but there are additional summer actions uh, for the state water project in the ITP. Um, there's also spring outflow action um, in the ITP for the State Water Project. Um, and uh, one of the differences under uh, CESA, there are some species that are listed under the California Endangered Species Act, but not under the federal. Um, and a significant species there is the long fin uh, smelt. So there are actions associated with long, long fin uh, that are fall under the ITP that do not fall under the biops. Uh, <clears throat> Kristen talked about the coordinated operating operations agreement. And so uh, 
yeah, when we're talking about meeting all of these requirements in the Delta, the question is, you know, there could be releases from any one of the major reservoirs, whether it be CBP or SWP. Uh, how do we determine where the releases come from, uh, from the upstream to meet a flow requirement, for example, an outflow requirement from the Delta? Well, this agreement is uh, outlines under what sorts of conditions uh, which project is responsible for, for uh, which what proportion of the flows are, are needed from which project. And this could be in the form of releases from upstream. It could also be from uh, reduction in uh, exports from either the SWP's Banks pumping plant or the CBP's Jones pumping plant. So uh, we'll talk a little bit, how does the state water project actually uh, develop its water supply? Uh, so it seems like a fairly fundamental question. Um, uh, so we talked about all these other requirements um, for in the Delta itself. Um, and uh, Kristen went into uh, settlement contracts for senior, senior water users uh, that existed. Uh, State Water Project also has entered into contracts with settlement contractors. And uh, so they have a senior water rights. Uh, we have to ensure that they, those are met prior to the uh, state water project being able to develop supply. But uh, taking into account all of those factors in the winter spring period is when uh, additional water that is access to all of the other needs, so that would include all other legal diverters of water plus meeting the standards in the Delta. Anything excess of that um, is when, um, in this example, the State Water Project would be capturing water in Lake Oroville and would be capturing excess supplies um, for uh, runoff, direct runoff in the valley itself. There's a, could be a significant amount which is captured at banks and stored in San Luis Reservoir. So there's two primary locations where the project is picking up these excess flows. Um, and that's in San Luis Reservoir and Lake Oroville. So once, uh, of course, that's also the low demand period. So uh, what happens when, during the summer and fall when we have a high demand? Well, at that point, we are releasing previously stored water from Lake Oroville. When we have water that's in excess of what's needed for the Delta needs, we can release additional stored previously stored water from Oroville and re-divert it at Banks Pumping Plant for delivery south of the Delta. Uh, we supplement that, those supplies with the previously stored San Luis uh, reservoir storage that was captured during the winter. And that also helps meet those uh, high demand period deliveries. And we have a process, an allocation process, similar to uh, what Kristen talked about on the side of this, the Central Valley project. Uh, these are just some of the key uh, elements that we're looking at. Um, the Oroville storage that we have from the previous year, um, forecasted hydrology, both the, the forecasted hydrology going directly into Oroville and some of it's going uh, into the, the Delta or into the, some of the other reservoirs and, and uh, comes in as unregulated flow into the Delta. Uh, we need to know the timing of that. Uh, on a monthly basis, we get that sort of information from uh, DWR's uh, Division of Flood Management that also um, coordinates the uh, snow survey um, uh, process that is up and down this year. Uh, they, in cooperation with other with forest service, other, other water districts in the various watersheds. Uh, they go out and actually physically measure the snowpack, uh, compile the information and uh, run through their models and come up with um, forecasted inflows to all the major reservoirs on a monthly basis for the coming year at various exceedances. So um, anything from a, a dry uh, scenario, 90% exceedance to um, kind of median conditions for precip assumed for the rest of the year to a wet uh, condition that would only be exceeded 10% of the time. So there's a full range of, of probability forecasts that we receive. Uh, we base our allocations on the more conservative uh, number. Um, we also take into account the, uh, all of the Delta restrictions that I just walked you through. Um, and we come up with uh, banks pumping capabilities. 
Um, the timing is really important in terms of how much of that water can be stored in San Luis. Um, and then ultimately we get our uh, delivery capability uh, uh, estimates for the year. And this is, we start this process. Um, unfortunately, our contracts are based on a, our, our require a December 1st initial allocation. And um, that, that's a date that's very early and it's really prior to getting the bulk of any uh, uh, rains for the year. Um, so it's primarily just based on the amount of storage that we have carried over from the previous year. Um, we have to, and then we make conservative assumptions on the amount of precipitation that will fall for that the remainder of that year. But that's the initial forecast. Uh, subsequent updates each month based on the snow survey information that I just talked you through um, and any projected uh, delta regulations that would come into play. Um, and then the final, we step through that on a month to month basis through the spring with the final allocation typically made by June. I think this is this is my uh, last or second to last slide here, um, uh, but this this gives you a feel how um, as as the as the project statewide project has come online um, late '60s, um, the, um, uh, the 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 blue the blue line here is the request. So this is the requested demand from our 29 contractors as it's changed over the years. So you can see really that demand got to the full build out by about the year 2000. And um, the, uh, the green bars is how much of that requested demand we've been able to uh, meet uh, through the allocation process. And as you can see early on, we were most of the time, a few exceptions, 77 uh, drought on record, um, we were able to meet the uh, requested demand uh, we started to come up short in the um, kind of six-year drought, late late eighties, early nineties. Met it again during the the, the wet late nineties period, uh, but now the last twenty years, there's a, there's a couple things going on. We have requested demand is is um, been at its uh, full table A amount, which is a little over four million acre feet, um, but we've also seen um, um, you know some would call a 20 year drought that we've been in. <laughs> so it's been a combination of drought. We've also had uh, some of the um, more restrictive uh, regulations have also kicked in since about uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, so combination of drought, um, uh, more regulation um, has put us in this uh, essentially chronic uh, shortage condition on the state water project in terms of we haven't been able to meet 100% delivery since 2006. Um, and uh, so that's that's kind of how we, uh, where we sit today. Um, and um, I believe, yes, that was my last uh, slide. And uh, so I think uh, Kristen and I were, were both open for um, questions at this point. Well, I wanna thank uh, you, John and, and uh, Kristen for uh, providing such a wealth of valuable information uh, for our science board. And we'll open the floor to board member questions. Bob, do you still have a question? Bob and then Diane. I do, I do have uh, two questions. Um, um, I think they're fairly simple to answer, at least two questions to start is, the, uh, the dams that are in place for the most part, do they have fish passage facilities? Are they able to allow migratory fish to? <coughs> That's my first question. Um, well, I can start. So our facilities, uh, trying to see if there's one that I'm missing, but they do not have fish passage facilities. That's one thing that we're looking into. They're very large structures. Um, and they also, many of them have uh, additional dams that are not owned by the federal government upstream of them. So that is something that we're looking into. I think we've been doing some studies on uh, fish passage, particularly at Shasta for a number of years, um, but it's certainly something that we, uh, that we continue to evaluate. Um, but, but most of our dams are, are there's either um, challenges with the dam itself or they're uh, in the instance of New Maloney's there's two other dams that are downstream of it as well as dams that are upstream of it um, so uh, more of a 
coordinated effort to be able to do fish passage um, back to those original habitat locations. Well, understood. It is a complex issue, very complex. Uh, second question has to do with, uh, I noticed in your photos that a lot of your uh, conveyance structures were open to the atmosphere. And I'm just curious as to what percentage of the annual influx of water that would come into the delta is actually lost through uh, evaporation that it's either stored or transported to other parts of the state. Yeah, so um, I can I can start. Um, so in terms of the um, yeah open air, I think you're referring to uh, so actual aqueduct itself, um, as well as well as the reservoirs, reservoirs and the aqueducts and canals. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think the uh, the evaporation. I don't have an exact figure on like uh, percentage, but there is not a, it's not an insignificant number in terms mm -hmm. of the amount of evaporation that that does occur on the, the surface uh, of like Lake Oroville, for example. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I would have to, I would have to get back to you on, on give you a better feel for what proportion that, that, that might be or into the total storage. Uh, I appreciate just learning what that is. It, you know, as you're well aware in warm climates, it can be a significant amount of the annual input. And, I'm just curious as to how much it is for the Delta area. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. Hi, thanks for those presentations. And, and I know that Diane probably had to go teach and, and hopefully she'll be back so she can ask her question. Um, I have two questions, I think they're related. So I was, I was intrigued by that very long history of flow or maybe it was precipitation that John presented. Um, and have you ever looked at whether the variability of flow has, has really changed or is the management challenge really that demand is so close to supply at this point? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, we're definitely looking very closely at um, any changes um, to um, not only precipitation patterns, but more fundamentally the runoff uh, patterns uh, because that's that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of what we're actually managing um, you know so a lot of the, uh, the forecast for uh, climate change as it relates to uh, northern California um, it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of the total amount of precipitation um, but what's what's uh, the, the the very strong signal is the warming so um, that's that's the part that is having the most significant changes in terms of you know, we're, we're seeing uh, things that were not even anticipated to be uh, observed until later about mid-century, which was a lack of any snowpack, uh, significant snowpack in 2015, for example. That, that was, a, it was a huge change that we hadn't seen anything like that historically. Um, I think what we saw last year, for example, um, in terms of uh, the low efficiency on the snowmelt, um, uh, both in terms of evaporative and, and uh, you know, very parched soils or, the, you know, very large losses to that snowpack. Uh, we saw very little runoff. Um, the, so, the, so what we're really seeing already, not only was it forecasted uh, as part of, of climate change, but just the observed record uh, since really pronounced since about the year 2000 is just the warming trend that we've seen. And so that one um, we don't need models to, to even uh, indicate that there's a change there. We, we were observing it, and that's, that's having some profound um, effects in terms of the actual, not only the timing of runoff, but the amount of runoff that we would expect to see from a given amount of precipitation. So precipitation itself, um, it's, you know, unfortunately, it, it will continue to be a challenge in terms of its variability from year to year, um, but what we, the, the known one of the one thing we do know, though, is that the, the warming uh, that we have experienced is going to change those runoff patterns. Thanks. Can I ask another management related question? Uh, so I'm also curious, you seem a little frustrated that you have to do these initial allocations in December. Has anyone ever looked at how uh, your final allocations relate to your December allocations and and, you know, how accurate are they? And then. Given that, has there been any discussion of changing when you do your initial allocations? 
Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so the uh, initial allocation is done in December. And I, and I said we use, typically we will use a conservative estimate uh, for precipitation for the remainder of the year or runoff uh, for the remainder of the year. And typically we, we use uh, the 90% exceedance uh, as a rough guide of, so this is, you know, we're assuming, and this is based on historical trends, uh, based on, uh, you look at the 100 year history, we, we take a look at 100 different traces uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, we look at uh, the runoff that would be achieved uh, that from uh, precipitation that, that exceeds that amount by 90% of the time. So it's, it's the lowest, it's the driest, 10%. Um, and so what we would expect is, since we're making a fairly conservative uh, estimate on, on their future runoff, that we will not have to, the, the allocation level that we set will be good 90% uh, of the time. And that there will be though 10% of the time that the water doesn't show up and we would have to reduce that allocation. And that, that, that's pretty close to what we're, we're observing. So um, we, there are instances where we do have to make reductions in the allocation. Last year was a good example. We started out a 10% allocation to the state water project and we, we had to cut it early spring to 5%. So um, you know, last year was a really good example of, of the uh, hydrology turning uh, dry, very dry on us. And I mean, it was a dry year to begin with, uh, but we ended up seeing the, the driest uh, April through June, uh, April, well, really April through uh, September period on record, uh, the warmest and driest. And uh, so that, um, that had an effect, but yeah, that, that's, that's the management uh, decision is, is um, the policy decision right now is to, to, to uh, make uh, um, allocation decisions based on 90%. Thank you. Okay, Tom. I, this is a question to both of you. Uh, assuming the conveyance structure is built, what are gonna be the biggest changes in the uh, operation of the water system in the Delta? How, how will it impact your operations? Yeah, so I think the, the best way to uh, to answer that is if you recall the one slide that I had up in terms of how the water supply is developed for the state water project. And um, in the, uh, maybe I can bring that up, let's see. Um, so on this piece here, hopefully you can see that. Oh, no, you can't. There, now you can't. Um, so in the, in the winter spring period, uh, when we're essentially capturing those excess flows that are coming into the system. So we are catch, capturing some of them upstream into Lake Oroville. Um, but there is also a significant amount of runoff that's occurring in the, from the rain that's hitting the valley floor or unregulated rivers that are coming into the system. And, um, this is when there's an opportunity to capture some of that supply, put it in San Luis Reservoir. Now, unfortunately, uh, you know, this is also the habitat for uh, listed species. And so we have a lot of restrictions on when we can actually pick up uh, uh, excess flow. Um, what the uh, new conveyance, the idea behind the new conveyance is by locating the intake structures on the north part of the delta, um, it, would, it would remove at least some of that conflict with uh, we talked about the old and middle river corridors that those are uh, thought to be significant in terms of trying to limit how, how net negative those flows go. If we can capture the water more upstream, it would eliminate some of that, um, that conflict and it, it, it could allow uh, the capture of additional excess flows uh, that are coming uh, from the Sacramento Valley into the export uh, locations here south of the Delta, because it'd be bypassing the Delta. So that's the primary, that's the primary, uh, I'd say that's the primary change that would affect the uh, state water project operations. And Kristen, what about the uh, Central Valley project? 
Yeah, so uh, it depends a little bit about how the final project comes together and, and what kind of uh, operating uh, approach is used on it. But uh, there's a, a big difference between the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project is the Central Valley Project is what we call storage rich and pumping poor. Uh, and it's where the state water project is the opposite. So we have numerous upstream reservoirs and our pumping plant is, uh, although it's a very large pumping plant compared to the state water projects facility, it's much smaller. So uh, I think we're, we're less than half of the total capacity that they have um, as is where uh, the, the, the state can capture a significant amount more excess flows in the systems. We're quite limited by our facility. So I think there will be opportunities when uh, those fishery regulations uh, are limiting how much we can move and those tunnels can help uh, help move water um, uh, without impacting those fishery uh, um, uh, impacts. I think that's certainly something that can benefit both projects. Um, but uh, but in, in general, I think um, it's, a, it's challenging to see exactly how it's going to affect the CVP because it really depends on what kind of operating rules and how we uh, work with the state on that project. Thank you. Okay, Tanya. Yeah, thanks for the presentations. Those were both uh, excellent. And I guess this question is, is for both of you as well. I'm, I'm curious a bit about how and to what extent uh, long-term planning informs the kind of operations. I, I heard from both of you a lot of emphasis on the, the importance of, kind of monthly and seasonal planning, especially given regulatory constraints and all of those things. And I guess I, I, I just want to kind of hear how you're thinking about you know, long-term planning that, that you have to consider when you're taking into account climate change or changes in demand conditions and those types of things. So. And how does that work for each project? And, and also, how does that work for the coordinated operations agreement? Is there some sort of long-term mechanism where that gets kind of updated regularly? And um, yeah, so thanks. Um, I, I can start if you want, Kristen. Sure. Uh, I, I can start with the second part of your question, or last part of your question first. And um, in terms of the update of the uh, coordinated operations agreement, yes. Um, the agreement does call for periodic, uh, you know, review of that. And in fact, uh, there was a recent addendum to that agreement um, in uh, 20, end of 2018. Um, so uh, yes, this is something that we do do take a look at uh, uh, periodically, especially if there's uh, significant changes to um, the regulations that we're operating to, um, or actually, I would say. Um, any other observed uh, changes that we see in the system. Um, and I think one of those system, one of those changes has been the more extreme um, conditions that we've seen of late, um, both in terms of, uh, you know, as Kristen said, the wettest year on, on record uh, 2017 uh, was, you know, shortly followed um, the year with no snowpack 2015, uh, 14 and 15 were, we thought was, you know, kind of a, once in a generation type event. And yet here we are, uh, we just got through uh, 2021, which was in some, in some respects drier than what we saw in 14, 15. Um, you know, so I think there's a number of efforts in terms of responding to this in the long term. Um, so State Water Project, you know, San Luis Reservoir is operated uh, on, a, on an annual basis and cycled, uh, filled, attempt to fill as much as possible in the winter. And, um, and then release it uh, in the, the summertime. So that's kind of looked at on an annual basis. Um, Lake Oroville <clears throat> is, is looked at more of a, a longer term, um, but it's really, it's really a trade-off between kind of water supply reliability one year uh, versus kind of long-term yield. Uh, those, are, those, are, those are two kind of two, two trade-offs. Um, but in light of uh, 14, 15, um, uh, we did decide to make some um, some changes on our carryover storage, for example, at Lake Oroville. We're, we're uh, relying on, uh, you know, carrying over more to protect against these kind of 14, 15 type events. And in fact, that's that's something we put in play just prior to the last two year period. And um, uh, it, was, it was still a struggle. Um, so, uh, the other things that we're looking at is, uh, so I talked a little bit, I touched a little bit on this forecast informed reservoir operations. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, looking at new ways to store water 
when it is available. It's because one thing, we, there, there are still many periods where there's ample amount of water in the system. And in fact, we'll, have, we'll see more extreme cases where there's large amounts of flows. It's how do you capture that flow when it's available, right? So you can look at um, physical infrastructure. And, and here, here's where we're, uh, you know, we're partnering with a lot of the, um, uh, the WSIP um, type projects under Prop, Prop 1 uh, managed by the California Water Commission. Uh, a lot of those projects depend on the, uh, the state water project and Central Valley project to help uh, implement uh, these, these projects and, and make them work. Um, so that's, that's an effort that's, that's underway. Uh, we want to be supportive of, of new storage opportunities where it makes sense. Um, the, the FIRO process up at Lake Oroville, New Mullard's Bar is, is looking at ways that uh, perhaps part of it is uh, digging a deeper hole in advance of a large atmospheric and more extreme atmospheric river event for a flood on the flood side of the, the scenario. But on the flip side of that, <clears throat> it's just as important to be able to forecast when we're going to hit a prolonged dry period. Um, that's one of the things we're seeing with, with, with uh, climate change is we get, we get stuck in these patterns for longer periods of time. So uh, it's either wet for longer period or dry for a longer period than, than we have seen historically. And so if we're able to better predict those dry periods as well, if we're in the part of the year, late winter, early spring, where we can start filling that reservoir maybe sooner than we do today, um, there's a potential increase in additional supply that could be used for multiple purposes. Um, and um, uh, so that's a way to increase storage capabilities without physically building any new infrastructure. Um, so that's just changing the operating rules at the reservoir. So that's kind of a software change rather than a hardware change, if you will. But that's, that's a way to help, uh, you know, improve the ability to capture these more uh, episodic events. Um, and groundwater storage is certainly uh, another, another one. And a lot of the WSIP projects are groundwater uh, storage facilities that will interact directly with some of our state water contractors uh, we'll be partnering with these, um, these groundwater storage uh, proposals uh, up and down the, uh, the California aqueduct. Um, and uh, so we will help facilitate uh, the, uh, uh, the recharge of those facilities and then the extraction during the drier periods. So um, those, are all, those, those are all activities that are directly related to, uh, you know, the increased um, struggles that we see uh, in, in terms of pairing up that supply with the demand. Um, and uh, this, is, this is where all of our, our attention is now. Yeah, maybe I'll add a, a couple things to that. And I, I second everything that John said, really looking at, at other projects and other ways to, um, to incorporate storing that wet time, the, that, that uh, wet year water is really um, kind of the, the biggest buffer. When we think about reclamation projects across the state, it's it's uh, the Central Valley project is um, is provides a very critical water supply for a critical food source, and it, I think sometimes it gets lumped in with some of our other projects, such as the Colorado Basin, where we have uh, Hoover and Glen Canyon dams, but. Our, our storage is basically nothing <laughs> compared to what kind of storage they have there. So for example, Shasta Reservoir, our largest reservoir is only four and a half million acre feet as where uh, uh, Hoover and Glen Canyon are over 50 million acre feet. I mean, they're just, uh, just significantly larger uh, amounts of storage. And that affords them the ability to really look more long-term and kind of make those software adjustments as John mentioned, to try to account for things as they're changing as where our reservoirs are much smaller. They, uh, they all work together, but they each have their own unique characteristics. And, uh, and so our operating window is, is, is significantly smaller. So we used to say that Shasta is a three-year reservoir, meaning it can be relied upon to get, to a, get through a three-year drought. Folsom is a one-year reservoir, meaning it can be relied on for one dry year, but there's not enough storage to go much beyond that. However, over the past uh, 30 years or so, uh, the, uh, with the endangered species, um, with the winter run endangered species that have been listed, there has been a significant focus on 
uh, on temperature management in Shasta. We had a temperature control device constructed in the 90s. And so because of that, uh, that really limits our ability to pull that, pull that reservoir down too low. Um, so like, for example, in 1977, uh, which was the drought sim most similar to last year, that reservoir got pulled down all the way to, I think it was about 500,000 acre feet. Um, so it's, of course, we'd like to keep it higher than, than it ended last year, um, but there's a big difference in, uh, in how it was managed prior to that, to those uh, species being listed versus today. Um, and so what that's done is really limited that operating window now of what you can operate Shasta within, and going much higher than that uh, bumps you into that flood risk. Right, so uh, so we find that if we end the reservoir too high, all we're doing is increasing that risk and increasing the impact of of storms that are that are uh, that could be coming in the um, in the winter. And what we're seeing with climate change, as John mentioned, is that we can expect to see more extreme events, meaning that those very large warm storms could be coming in more frequently, which means that we need to be prepared for them. So there's a huge risk then to ending a year with very very high storage in case the next year's dry. So it's certainly a balancing act, and I think given the tools we have right now, it's a it's a major challenge to just do software updates to do that. <laughs> I like that term, John. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> um, I think it's really looking at um, how how can we uh, kind of th thinking about the three movements of water. How can we get better at moving water from those wet years into dry years? Um, because uh, we just don't um, our, our current capacity and our current facilities uh, are are quite limited. Let me ask a fishy question or two. I noticed in uh, John's, um, one of his slides, he used the term uh, ecological triggers. What, what do you mean by that? What's, what kind of a ecological trigger feeds into this? Yeah, so, so a couple of triggers um, would be flow. One would be flow. Um, and uh, so for example, one of our actions uh, can be triggered by certain flow threshold uh, coming into the, the, the Delta on the Sacramento River. Uh, but another real significant one um, uh, that's been around now for quite a while is turbidity. Um, if, we, uh, if we observe a certain turbidity level at uh, you know, key stations uh, within the central Delta, that also is an indication that um, uh, in, this, in this particular case, Delta smelt, um, habitat, it, 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 they would typically follow the turbidity during their life cycle uh, when the adults are, uh, when they move upstream, they will follow the turbidity. And if the turbidity moves as far up and into a location that would put it at, put their, uh, their larval at, at risk later in the season, um, that's, that's the reason for the uh, moderation of the exports is to prevent that turbidity uh, condition from getting uh, too far, too too close to the project pumps, so that there would be that increased risk uh, later in the year to the offspring of of the adults. So that that's a, that's a couple examples. Um, I don't know, Kristen, is there? Do you have any or? Yeah, um, one other. Uh, so the Delta Cross Channel Gate is kind of a uh, um, that's a. A significant piece of our salinity operation, but it certainly can have major impacts to fish when they're moving past the Delta Cross Channel gates. So we do have certain time periods uh, where where closures are required based on um, uh, fish that are caught uh, in certain areas. Is it fair to say that the uh, that these I want to call environmental uh, conditions are largely tied to endangered or listed species? or exclusively tied to them? Um, I would say primarily, I'm just trying to think if exclusive is, is right. Um, um, it's hard to ever say for sure, but yeah, yeah they're, primarily, they're primarily tied to uh, protections for endangered and listed species. Yeah. Yeah, I think pr primarily there are some uh, indications that we get uh, from other species, such as fall run, um, that can trigger modifications to operations. Um, particularly at, uh, at Shasta, we've been trying to modify um, basically our fall operations, trying to limit, um, trying to trying to get our minimum flows uh, kind of achieved as quickly as possible without negatively impacting the winter run, so that the fall run don't. 
um, don't spawn at, at higher levels that then get dewatered as we go down into a minimum winter flow. Um, and so there's a lot of monitoring that goes on looking for where those fish are to try to inform that operation, but, uh, but pro probably primarily those listed species. Okay, thanks, Jay. Thank you very much for those really excellent presentations. Um, the water system here is, is pretty complex and, and it extends to, to thousands really in the end of, of retail water systems and, and quite a few other wholesale systems. Quite often the, the large projects that you all operate uh, are supplying wholesalers that provide water to other wholesalers and to retailers. How much how important are the operations of all of those other uh, customers of yours and their ability to manage water and store water and their own independent sources in the overall success of the system? Well, well, I, I can speak uh, maybe a little bit to um, some of the state water project uh, customers and, and, and wholesalers, as you said, uh, like Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. So I think that, you know, so they certainly have their experts and they, uh, they monitor the project operations very closely. And I think a lot of their decisions in terms of their investments are, are based on the, the limitations that they're seeing on the uh, um, state water project mm -hmm. operations. So, so for example, you know, Metropolitan has invested heavily in some of their uh, local uh, storage. Uh, so Diamond Valley Reservoir is a good example of that. So, you know, they think they recognized early on that um, uh, there's going to be a very a more dynamic, as I showed in the one chart, uh, you know, in the past, we were always, always able to meet 100% of the requests. And that became, became pretty clear that that's not going to continue to be the case, that it's going to be feast or famine. And uh, so they want to be prepared. They want to invest in ways that they can capture the uh, feast years. And so that's the reason that they've invested in um, both groundwater, uh, I think Hayfield uh, groundwater uh, basin is a good example of a groundwater storage facility in their in their uh, district, and Diamond Valley is a, a good example of surface water. Uh, same for Kern County Water Agency; they've invested heavily in um, their. Uh, they have a high capacity turnouts so off of the off of the California Aqueduct in terms of being able to capture uh, more supplies to recharge their groundwater basins. Uh, during the very wet years, so that they'll have, uh, you know, help help the sustainability of that groundwater uh, program down there, and so they've really reacted to uh, what they see as the limitations of the project's ability to reliably deliver water on a on a on a year-to-year -year basis. So um, that's just a couple examples of, of you know how how some of our 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 largest wholesaler customers have have responded. Yeah, I'd say when we get into these drier years, uh, there it's critical um, uh, how they manage their water supply. I'll, I'll give a couple examples. Um, how uh, some of our agricultural areas are managing their groundwater is very important because it, it dictates how much groundwater is able to be used uh, uh, for meeting some of those supplies, um, which then affects how they would look at uh, and how they would um, prioritize surface water supplies, especially when it comes to senior water rights uh, or riparian water rights that, uh, that are not um, they're not under our allocation structure from the project. So, so the more that they can be relying on those groundwater supplies, the less pressure it is on the, on the surface water. Um, another key area, last year uh, we had a 25% uh, municipal and industrial allocation, which is uh, uh, right around the public health and safety limit. For some, for some districts, they needed more water to meet public health and safety demands. And the way that we define public health and safety demands is the amount that's necessary to meet certain uh, minimum demands after accounting for all the other water that they have. So how much they've been able to store in their other facilities uh, or how much they've been able to put into a groundwater bank or, or any other tools or how much they've been able to lower their demands all play a critical role in what we're delivering now for public health and safety. And so uh, if we have a, a, a district that is asking for public health and safety and they have their surface water reservoir, for example, uh, uh, is having a challenge where they can't store water there. Now that's a huge impact on, on what we're doing because now it changes how much we need to supply them just to meet some minimum public health and safety. So it can certainly matter quite a bit uh, when we get into these uh, drier, drier and drought years. Thank you very much. 
I had one little question, uh, just sort of geeky. There's been a huge change in the uh, electricity prices over the last decade, really, with uh, solar power providing a lot of uh, relatively cheap electricity during the daytime. It sort of turned the, the daily pattern of, uh, of energy prices on its head. Has that changed your operations much? Yeah, I can speak for the CVP. Um, so it doesn't change our operations on a, on a daily or certainly a weekly basis, um, but it certainly changes. Uh, we When we're releasing from a major facility such as Shasta, uh, and that's going into a regulating reservoir such as Keswick Reservoir, right? So the water to the river is maintained by Keswick, so that stays constant. But we're fluctuating Shasta based on what those, uh, del what those um, uh, power prices are throughout throughout the day. And so it certainly changes that as to where uh, I think we used to have a little bit more stability. Now with solar, there is a huge amount of solar in the market, but it pretty much goes offline at three o'clock. <laughs> so, so then there's a massive demand at three o'clock. And so that's been a big challenge, especially when we get into these extremely high demand situations that we were in this past summer and that, uh, and that we were in, I think the year before that as well, where we're trying to constantly adjust and backfill where that solar is, which is certainly a different situation than we were in producing power, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, and I'll just add from the State Water Project's perspective, yeah, it's recognized there's been a, you know, very significant change in the, in the pattern, power pattern. So, you know, uh, prior to all the renewables coming online, it was, it was much more predictable in terms of, of, you know, high prices right during the middle of the day um, and uh, low prices during the night. And so, you know, like clockwork, uh, pretty much the same schedule, uh, you know, maximize that pumping at night and, and maximize the generation during the day. And it's, it's, it's made it much more variable uh, because, you know, solar has really pushed down the, the peak uh, right during the middle of the day. But as Kristen said, then that price goes sky high once the solar goes off line in the evening. Um, so there's almost like, it's, it's, a, it's a much different pattern than we used to see. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that hydropower really represents is a good, it works very well with, with, uh, the, other re, with the other renewables in that it's, it's quick on and off in terms of responding to, say, change in the wind. Uh, that's the one, you know, that's, of course, the weak point with the wind and solar is you can't control when the uh, fuel is being provided. You know, it's, it's, you're, you're at the mercy of, of, of Mother Nature there. And so the other parts of the system have to respond uh, to, to that, um, that uh, you know, uh, unmanageable uh, time period that the, that the renewables uh, present. But yeah, it's, it's had pretty significant impacts on the scheduling on the state water project as well. Has it affected much your operation at Clifton Court Four Bay, particularly as it interacts with the environmental Old and Middle River flows and things like that? Um, not Clifton Court necessarily that much. Uh, Banks Pumping Plant, yes. Um, we're fairly restricted on uh, when we can actually uh, uh, divert water at Clifton Court uh, based on the, uh, the high tides. Um, so it's really the, the tidal cycle that's going to drive the Clifton Court diversions. Um, and, and really, so that part's kind of fixed, uh, but Banks is, is going to be variable. But that's what Clifton Court provides us, is that ability to... Four banks. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Well, I want to uh, thank John and Kristen again. Uh, this has really been an excellent presentation and good background for us. Uh, Edmund, do we have any uh, public comments? Um, yes, we have um, two public comments. Um, we'll first go with Mark Shapiro, then Deirdre Deirdre Dan. Um, when, you, when you provide your public comments to the board, please be sure to state your name and affiliation. Um, Mark, I have unmuted your microphone. Oh, okay, great. Wow. Hey, um, well, thank you very much. And thank you all for this really interesting presentation. I'm Mark Shapiro. I'm a journalist I'm, uh, writing uh, about the F2 line and other things. And I also teach at the uh, journalism school at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, I a question was this, um, how often um, does the state uh, or the Bureau of Reclamation have to release water from the reservoirs to uh, maintain salinity standards. And I was wondering 
one, how often that occurs, and number two, has there been an increase or decrease if you look over the last 10 or 15 years as to how often those releases take place. And I'm sorry, my phone's ringing, I want to turn it off. <laughs> um, did that come through? So I guess that's to um, John and Kristen, Kirsten, but I don't know if they're there anymore. Um, but anyway, any of you could answer that question, I suppose, um, about the releases of water to maintain salinity levels. Hello? Yes, yeah, so th this is John um, with DWR. Um, you know, I don't have an exact figure on that. Um, I, I, I guess the only thing I would say is because we've seen a kind of a disproportionately dry period over the last 20 years, um, you know, it's probably uh, more releases for that purpose, uh, uh, just because of the nature of the, the way the hydrology has has uh, has been on the drier years are the years that we're typically needing to make those kind of releases to meet salinity. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, I guess one thing we didn't talk about was, um, uh, you know, sea level rise as, as term, in terms of another effect that we would anticipate from um, uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, that over time, uh, it will uh, probably present a, 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 a larger challenge in controlling that salinity as it will, uh, it will be a, a larger factor we would expect um, as, uh, as storage, as um, uh, uh, levels in the channels increase from uh, uh, salinity from the bay, um, that will present additional challenges on releases from the reservoirs uh, to maintain that freshwater corridor in the Delta. You yeah. have statistics? Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to add that we, we typically think of in just a normal year, not in a drought year, that we're uh, that we're releasing specifically for salinity in those uh, late spring, summer, and early fall months, and we're usually not releasing specifically in those uh, time where there's more water in the system, so late fall, winter, and early spring. Um, however, uh, in with that, we are always making minimum releases from the reservoirs, which are controlled by a number of different water right permits and uh, and um, uh, and, and regulations. So even then, sometimes the releases from the reservoirs are still meeting the salinity requirements. They might just not be releasing above minimums to, to meet it. So I, I would say fairly often, of course, when we get nice storm events coming in um, and we have high runoff, then, um, then it's the excess flow that's primarily meeting that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Statistics just indicating this or, or figures that um, would identify how often this occurs if, it, if it's increased over the last 20 years from X to Y, is that is that something that's possible to identify? I'm sure it's possible. I don't have that today, um, nor am I sure where, where the best source of, of getting that would be. Um, PPIC had a report come out in 2017 that looked at some of that uh, statistically. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, move on to the, uh, is it Deidre? Yes, Deirdre is next. You, uh, Deirdre. Your microphone has been muted, Deirdre. Oh, thanks, Deirdre Desjardins with California Water Research. And I again, wanted to say this was a really excellent uh, presentation. I did want to provide some essential history on the coordinated operating agreement that even the operators might not know. So the original applications by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to the State Water Resources Control Board assumed that the Central Valley Project would get the entire unimpaired flow of the Feather River which uh, was estimated recently at about 4.4 million acre feet a year on average. After this came out in the 1960s hearing, the board recessed the hearing and urged the Department of Water Resources to work out an agreement with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Um, DWR and Reclamation worked out an agreement to share the obligation for storage releases for invasive needs of 25% for the Department of Water Resources 
and 75% per US Bureau of Reclamation. The project also agreed to share shortages because they knew they weren't gonna get their full water supply. The agreement was amended in 1986 and again in 2018. The 2018 addendum states that in a third dry and critically dry year, DWR and USBR will meet to discuss additional changes to the percentage sharing of responsibility to meet in-basin use. Um, there's, so there's no formula worked out for this year if it's a third dry or critically dry year. And your esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Lund, uh, did do an insightful blog post uh, um, that the drought might continue. And uh, Daniel Swain is one of the best climate scientists in the state also uh, had some stuff about forecasting, which I put in a letter to you. We really could be there. Um, and I'm concerned that no information has been given to the water board about the proposed reservoir operations. Furthermore, although there's a lot of song and dance about optimized reservoir carryover, uh, they wouldn't refuse to provide either the forecast operations or the modeling. Even though we know that they do long-term modeling, um, we can't get it to look at it. Uh, and, and it's not, it may not be provided. Um, the, the, depart, the projects did ask for environmental flow standards to be waived last year. And they've got another petition this year and that's very, very bad for fishers uh, and for Delta water quality. And uh, it, it's really important to have outside experts and peer review to look at um, these, they're very complex reservoir operations models. And I will tell you, uh, you know, I did graduate work I, when uh, nonlinear forecasting and machine learning, we do not use state of the art optimization models for reservoir forecasting. And there was a really good state of the art system that was funded by the CPUC that was just never adopted. Um, and Eris George Kakos did comment about it. Um, I put his comments in my letter, um, but it, it, it's really a critical issue for adaptation to climate change. There's really good forecast available. There's, it's, there's a lot of really good science on multi-reservoir system optimization. And although this sounds good, um, the, you know, it also would really benefit um, from uh, have, letting stakeholders take a look at the modeling and having period. So thank you. And thank you. Thanks, Deidre. Um, I see that uh, Diane's back. Diane, I know you had a, your hand up before. Do you have a Question, burning question? Yes, and I, I don't know if Tom asked this question for me. I was uh, really interested in knowing some more about the relative importance of evaporative losses between the Central Valley project and the DWR project and how, um, if there's any estimates of how those have changed and are they primarily in the reservoirs or in the canals or, um, just a general overview of evaporative losses. Did, did Tom already ask that? Uh, Bob asked a very similar question about getting getting okay. those in. So I'll, I will uh, watch the recording now that I've done with my undergraduate class. I will watch the recording. Thank you very much, sorry. <laughs> well, but you did add a new point about uh, relative effect from different sources. So perhaps if we get a more thorough answer from the agencies, uh, they could take that into account. Thank you. Bob, do you have a... I have a follow-up question. It's uh, one that's slightly different, I think. There is very little, if anything, said in the presentations about water quality. And it maybe this is not you know, your respective missions, uh, but I am curious about how the organizations, the agencies are actually working with 
uh, for example, you know, local sanitation districts and with agricultural interests and, and others that would uh, somehow, you know, have effects on water quality uh, with, within the river systems and, and downstream. And, you know, perhaps you could say a few words about that. I, uh, I'm trying to learn about, uh, you know, who has responsibility for what. So if my question is off base, let me know too, and I'll, I'll uh, look elsewhere for a response. Yeah, I can I can start with that. So um, water quality is a big part of what I of what we do, but it's primarily focused on salinity management um, and the salts. Of course, there's a number of other water water quality concerns, um, but I think mo for the most part, at least for the Central Valley project, that comes more into play in coordinating. So if we've got uh, discharges that are that are higher in certain um, water quality parameters and they're near intakes, then we're coordinating with them on on when to modify intakes. Um, uh, our, our releases are, are are usually very large in comparison to uh, to some of those other inputs. So I think we're usually coordinating a little bit more with them uh, is where the responsibilities on them uh, are falling either to the to the regulators or to the individual um, uh, releasers. If that if that makes sense. For dischargers. Well, it does. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I will say there's one one caveat that we do uh, operate the Spring Creek debris dam, which uh, which is managing um, uh, the tailwaters from the, I think it's the Iron Mountain mine, um, and we do actually manage uh, uh, those releases for water quality to make sure that uh, what's coming into the Sacramento River is meeting certain standards. I think that's the only one within the Central Valley project, though. Maybe a quick follow-up question on these is, uh, you know, in terms of water quality, I guess uh, a lot of the other projects I deal with, it's it's largely pharmaceuticals and kind of non-traditional water quality issues that are coming to the forefront now. And uh, I'm not sure, at least in the rivers I work on, uh, the sanitation districts are not paying a lot of attention to this. They're measuring other types of parameters. Uh, but as part of your purview, uh, both in you know, reclamation and with the state agency, water agency, are you or is are people looking at this in any detail? Um, I'm not sure that the federal for the for the Central Valley project that we would be. Um, we do have other segments of reclamation that work in water quality, but I nothing comes to mind about working and monitoring pharmaceutical water quality. I don't know, John, did you have anything to add? Well, no, I guess the only thing I would add is, um, and I think you touched on it, Kristen, I mean, from a project level, we are, so we are, you know, wholesalers, we, we do not, we do not deliver treated water, that the, the treatments are done at the, uh, you know, by our customers um, and their sub subunits below them. Um, that being said, we do have, um, we, we do uh, monitor for certain constituent levels in uh, the water Supply in the that we have in the aqueduct, and uh, the folks that are be looking at that are our customers. So they they are looking very closely at the uh, at the monitoring that we do do throughout the aqueduct, and um, because this is the water they're going to be receiving, and so they need to adjust their treatments uh, processes to uh, accommodate whatever types of water that they're receiving from us. Great, thank you. Okay, I want to thank everyone again, and. Uh... Uh, I really hate to cut this off, but uh, but I will. And uh, I want to thank everyone again, and uh, I, I hope you'll uh, come back or if we have any more questions along the line. It's been extremely informative. Um, we're scheduled for a break, and I'm just going to make it a nine-minute break. So if you return at 3.20, uh, we'll see you then.
Spears. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we'll move on to item number three on our agenda, which is a discussion of the Delta Conveyance Project. And as background, in April of uh, 2020, the Science Board submitted a public comment to uh, DWR on a notice of uh, preparation for the Delta Conveyance Project and indicated our plans to review the environmental impact report and uh, we also highlighted areas of previous reviews on Delta Conveyance that DWR uh, should consider in preparing the upcoming EIR, our previous comments. So DWR gave us a, a thorough update on that in August of 2020 and um, addressed what was they knew about the upcoming project and how they would uh, intend to address our previous comments. And that was a, a summary of that discussion as part of your uh, meeting material. Well, today, uh, Carrie Buckman from DWR is going to give us a further review of what's going on and uh, <clears throat> orientate us to the project. And also, like in the past, uh, we do expect to uh, provide uh, a review of the EIR, uh, probably during the uh, open public comment period. And we'll learn more today about what the uh, uh, timetable of that uh, will be. And so the presentation by Carrie Buckman, we've asked her to uh, uh, what is being proposed, why it's being proposed, what's the status of the project development of the EIR, and when will the Delta ISB be expected to review the EIR, and what is the relationship between the EIR and the EIS. So Carrie, we really appreciate you coming and uh, giving uh, your uh, time and, and give us this uh, presentation of what what's happening and what you expect us to do. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So I do have some slides that I'm going to pull up. And hopefully, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think that I, I was only able to hear the, the tail end of the Q&A with John and Kristen, but I think that you guys heard quite a bit already about, uh, oh, sorry, changes that we are seeing in the, the precipitation and the climate conditions that, that the CVP and SWP operate within. And so as, as DWR is the owner and the operator of the State Water Project, we are understanding that this new normal and these changes are going to be persisting, and it really does does reinforce the need to modernize the Delta conveyance system. So we do expect less snow and more rain over a shorter and less predictable duration. And also we expect more frequent drought and flood cycles. So the goal that we're, we're considering through Delta conveyance is to try to capture water when it's available to potentially store for later use and drought. And so we're hoping that by adding points of diversion and creating flexibility, we'll promote a more resilient and flexible state water project in the face of these unstable future conditions. And the last few years have been really an example of how this could work. So the last two years were very dry. And last year, the state water project diverted almost no water from the Delta, just a, a little bit of water for health and safety purposes. So the deliveries that the state water project was able to make were really associated with diversions that occurred in prior years in 2019. And so that type of operation we see as being something that becomes even more, more important as we move into the future and climate conditions continue to change. So our project objectives reflect the fundamental reasons that we're considering the Delta Conveyance Project. So our purpose is to modernize the aging SWP infrastructure in the Delta to restore and protect the reliability of SWP water deliveries in a cost-effective manner, consistent with the state's water resilience portfolio. So DWR, as the owner and operator of the State Water Project, we want the project to be able to continue moving forward and pr to provide water supply in the face of many challenges. And those challenges are reflected in our objectives. So we are looking for a project to help address sea level rise and climate change, minimize water supply disruption due to seismic risk, protect water supply reliability, and provide operational flexibility to improve aquatic conditions. So because we're gonna be talking a lot about the Environmental Impact Report or EIR today, I wanted to just start with a little bit of, of background about the purpose of an EIR. So the purposes include to present information based on the best available science to demonstrate an effort 
to inform the public and decision makers about a project's potential significant environmental impacts and ways to avoid, minimize, reduce, or compensate for them, to demonstrate that the environment is being considered prior to approving the project, and that the agency has considered the environmental implications of its actions, and to ensure the prevention of environmental damage where, where possible by requiring implementation of alternatives or mitigation measures. So this is a, an overview of the process that we're, we're in the middle of, really, that we're going through for CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. So we started on line one with our initial outreach that started with a notice of preparation in January of 2020, which uh, the ISB submitted comments on for scoping. We then conducted scoping meetings and produced a scoping summary report that uh, summarized the process we went through and included all of the comments, including written comments and uh, verbal comments received during scoping meetings. And we also developed an agency outreach plan. Uh, they, we then moved into the project definition phase where we identified alternatives and further defined those alternatives. And that work was done uh, in collaboration with the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority who formed a stakeholder engagement committee to help identify ways to avoid effects to local communities through a design and construction process. Uh, so we took those alternatives and we started working on technical reports to help understand the technical aspects of the potential effects of those alternatives. And we're working now to analyze the impacts of the alternatives based on all of that information and where appropriate uh, include mitigation. So our next step is in line three, we're going to be turning all of this into a draft EIR for release mid, mid 2022. We will then circulate that EIR, uh, solicit comments, and have public meetings to collect comments. And then finally, we will respond to those comments, make changes in the draft EIR, uh, select a preferred alternative, and release a final EIR and make a decision and a notice of determination. So I wanted to talk a bit about how we developed alternatives, and then I'm going to go through the key alternatives in more detail in the following slides. So all of the alternatives went through a screening process. So we collected alternatives from a variety of sources. The, the key source was through scoping. So a lot of scoping comments suggested alternatives. And we put all of those alternatives from scoping, uh, from past documents, uh, ideas that our technical experts had. All of those went through a process to identify if they had the potential to meet most of the project objectives and potentially reduce the significant environmental impacts of the proposed project. And those screening criteria come from the CEQA requirements for alternatives. Based on that screening, we identified alternatives that will be analyzed in detail in the EIR. And those include a central alternative that is similar to the alignment in California water fix, and it's shown in this figure in orange. And we're looking at multiple capacities there, 3,000 CFS, 4,500 CFS, 6,000 CFS, and 7,500 CFS. We're also looking at an Eastern alternative, which is shown on the figure in blue. And this, this alignment is closer to I-5. And it, we're looking at multi multiple capacities here as well, which 3,000 CFS, 4,500 CFS, 6,000 CFS, and 7,500 CFS. Uh, and then we also added an alternative called the Bethany alternative. And that follows the blue eastern alignment uh, to a point sort of partway down the, the tunnel alignment where it shifts to go more south to connect directly to Bethany Reservoir. And we're looking at that alternative at 6,000 CFS. Uh, additionally, one of the things that we heard a lot from the public comments is that rather than looking at a Delta Conveyance project, we should consider alternate supplies within the water agency service areas. So the idea is that if the state water project didn't provide that water, then, then water agencies could take other actions to provide alternate supplies. And that does not meet our fundamental objective for this project, which is to, con to continue having reliable water supply from the state water project. But we do recognize that, that those are likely efforts that water agencies would take if the Delta Conveyance Project were not to move forward. So as a result, we are including other potential actions as part of our no project alternative and analyzing the potential impacts and benefits there. So I'm gonna talk more about the, the three alignments that build our alternatives. I'll start with the central, central alignment. So this figure shows two intakes on the north, intake three and intake five. Uh, that varies depending on capacity. This is for 6,000 CFS. 
for 7,500, it would be three, ultra, three, three intakes for 3,000 CFS, so it would only be one. Uh, there are then 42.9 miles of tunnel to connect those intakes from the North Delta to the South Delta. Uh, the tunnel would include three launch shafts, three maintenance shafts, and three reception shafts. Uh, so if you look at the figure, you can see the green arrows are where the tunnel boring machines would launch. So in the north, there would be a double launch shaft at Twin Cities. One tunnel would launch north, and it would come. Uh, the tunnel boring machine would come out at the northernmost intake. Another TBM would launch south to be removed at Bolden Island. Uh, that would also be a launch shaft. So from there, a tunnel boring machine would be launched south, where it would meet a boring shaft coming north from the southern forebay at the Bacon Island reception shaft. So this tunnel would connect the north, northern delta intakes to the southern, southern facilities. At uh, the southern end, there is a pump station that would pump the water from the tunnel up to the surface. And then there would be a southern forebay that would help re-regulate the flows that are coming up from the pump station from the up from the tunnel through the pump station, and then it would connect to the bank's pumping plant to pump the water again up into the California aqueduct. So because there are two pump stations working together, we need that regulating storage in the middle. Now, there is also a set of tunnels that connect that southern forebay to the bank's pumping plant that's about 1.7 miles. Uh, if we have the 7,500 CFS option for the central alignment, that includes a connection to the Central Valley project. And so that would require an additional tunnel to connect over to the Jones pumping plant approach channel. So the second alignment I'm going to look at is the Eastern alignment. And this has the same facilities as the Central in the North and for the Southern facilities, but the middle is different. So uh, from Twin Cities launch shaft North, it would be the same facilities. But from Twin Cities moving south, instead of going through the central delta, this alignment stays closer to I-5. And the idea there is that uh, it might simplify logistics so that, that the construction traffic doesn't need to go into the south delta. Also, there are higher ground elevations and better shallow ground conditions for the, the tunneling through the ground. This is a longer facility or a longer alignment. There are 45.6 miles of tunnel, and there are three launch shafts four maintenance shafts, and three reception shafts. Uh, the launch shaft at Twin Cities would again be a double launch shaft. There would be another launch shaft at Lower Roberts Island that would launch north, meeting the, the TBM from Twin Cities for removal at Terminus Tract. And then the tunnel boring machine from the Southern Complex would also go towards Lower Roberts, and that would be a reception shaft as well. Uh, the Bethany Reservoir alternative is a, a new alternative that has not been considered in past efforts. And this one uses the same northern facilities as the central and eastern al alignments, but uh, varies a bit from there. So the northern alignment or the northern facilities north of Twin Cities are the same as central and eastern. From Twin Cities to Lower Roberts, that is the same as the eastern alignment. But from Lower Roberts south, there are some pretty substantial differences. So instead of going to a new southern, a new set of southern facilities, uh, the Bethany alternative would have a tunnel that goes towards Bethany Reservoir, which is uh, sort of a, a wide spot on the California aqueduct. It's part of the aqueduct, and it's a, a regulating facility. So the, this, this alternative would have a pump station, the Bethany pump station, from the tunnel, and it would pump water into pipelines that deliver water into Bethany Reservoir. And because this has only one pump station that pumps the water from the tunnel all the way up into the aqueduct, we don't need that regulating storage in the middle. So it doesn't have to have that southern forebay. That's a pretty large facility. So uh, this alternative includes 44.6 miles of tunnel. There are two launch shafts instead of three. So there are two double launch shafts at Twin Cities and at Lower Roberts. Then there are five maintenance shafts and three reception shafts. And then from the pump station, there would be about three miles of pipelines, and there would be four pipelines going in parallel up to the Bethany Reservoir. So when we published our notice of preparation in January of 2020, we identified the proposed project as being either a central or an eastern alignment. And since then, we have changed, we've recently changed to the Bethany alternative. 
So what we're looking at is identifying the Bethany alternatives as the proposed project in the draft EIR. And the reason, you know, the idea of alternatives analysis in CEQA is to consider a range of alternatives that have the potential to reduce significant environmental effects. And we found, in fact, that the Bethany alternative does reduce effects for wetlands and waters, which are really important, uh, not just for CEQA, but also for Section 404 permitting with the Corps of Engineers. So because the Bethany alternative would have less, less effect. We are changing our proposed project to the Bethany alternative. And we sent a letter to the Corps of Engineers to indicate that, to amend our 404 permit application and make the application consistent with how we're identifying the proposed project in the draft EIR. Uh, we do have more information on our website and the links in this presentation work. So you can look at the letter we sent to the Corps, as well as a Q&A that describes in more, more detail why we're looking at this. But I did want to just mention a few caveats. We're changing the proposed project, but that doesn't mean that we've made a decision. CEQA case law requires that we include a proposed project in our draft EIR, and so it just represents our current thinking. Right now, currently, we're thinking Bethany uh, would reduce effects compared to Central or Eastern. But we recognize that the public comment period could bring new issues to bear, and so we're not making any, any decisions on which alternatives to implement or to implement the project at all until after the public comment period is complete and we've responded to and addressed those comments. So I've talked a little bit so far about the facilities that are included in the Delta Conveyance Project, and I wanted to talk now a little bit about the operations. So we did this summer have a series of technical webinars and we discussed operations in one of those in the fisheries webinar. So if anyone's interested in more information, those are on our website. And we also have a blog on our website that, uh, that summarizes the, the content of that webinar. But I'm gonna summarize it pretty briefly here today. So uh, generally when we're talking about these new North Delta diversion intakes, they would operate in a system called dual conveyance where they would operate jointly with the existing South Delta intakes, the bank's pumping plant. So the idea is that there would be flexibility to use either South or North. And as we analyze this project, we need to we need to put together a set of assumptions about how we would operate the North Delta along with the South Delta. And so if anyone was involved in California Water Fix, there was an assumption that they, the two facilities would be operated pretty equally. But as we've gotten into this in more detail and talked to our operators, that's not how they think they really would, would operate the facilities. They really think that they would sort of first operate from the South Delta. So during the winter, and spring, they would use the South Delta to operate to the permitted diversion capacity. And then the North Delta would augment excess diversions during really high flow periods. So it would just be used to augment diversions when, when possible because there are high flows in the Sacramento River. Uh, during the summer and fall, there may be some shifting from South to North to help manage salinity and realize potential carriage water savings, but those are fairly small. And we think that these assumptions will help maximize benefits while also minimizing impacts. So we are developing a set of new operational criteria for the intakes, but we also are, are making sure that existing Delta operational criteria are met. And the criteria are primarily, bet, are primarily based on the 2020 incidental take permit for uh, long-term operations that DWR holds with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So from that, we, will, we, we still need to make sure that Delta outflow requirements are met. Uh, the D1641 requirements are a little different. That's from a state board requirement. It includes the export inflow ratio and the, the new project would account for the North Delta diversion as part of the exports in that calculation. Uh, we would also include making sure that we meet old and middle river flow requirements and export limits from the incidental take permit. So our operational criteria are, are a starting point for analysis. Uh, what we're planning to do is take these criteria, analyze operations, and if we, if we have effects, then we may consider either mitigation or changes to these operational criteria to try to help reduce those effects. So our criteria are to try to help um, avoid effects to fish, and they're really based on this conceptual model of how fish out-migrate through the intake reach, that there are, are periods throughout the wet season where juveniles are out migrating, but there are generally pulses of out migration as well based on cues for the fish. So considering that we've developed a set of criteria 
where we will have a set of bypass flow requirements that are always in place. Uh, and the idea is that when the river flow is very low, there would be no diversions. And then uh, generally low, there would be a low flow diversion. And then when the river level reaches a certain point, we can gradually increase diversions from the, the North Delta facility until flows are very high when we would meet the 6,000. I think that there is sort of a, a perception that if this, if this project were built, it would be operated at 6,000 CFS year round. And that's, that's not the case. Uh, we would only be able to operate that under pretty high flow conditions in the Sacramento River. Uh, in addition, we would layer on a set of pulse protection requirements. So during times that there are pulses of fish, we would further reduce those flows to protect those fish pulses. And then the, all of the time, we would also be meeting a set of approach and sweeping velocity requirements. And these are more specific to the intakes and the areas around the intakes. The approach velocity discusses how fast the water is moving into the fish screen and through the fish screen. And the sweeping velocity is how fast the water is moving past the fish screen. And there are requirements from the resource agencies for these to make sure that the water uh, helps the fish move past the intakes and reduces near field impacts near the fish screen. Uh, so one other piece of the project that I wanted to develop or wanted to discuss is that in 2021, we've been focusing quite a bit on developing a community benefits program to incorporate into the proposed project. And uh, given that this is a program for the community, we've been working to try to get quite a bit of input and develop this in collaboration with the community. So a community benefits program in general is a defined set of commitments made by the project proponents in coordination with the local community to create tangible and potentially significant economic and social benefit to the residents, businesses, and organizations facing project impacts. And for us, the idea here is that we understand that CEQ was a pretty prescriptive process. And so the, the things that are analyzed under CEQ and mitigated under CEQ may not consider the full suite of effects that are felt by the local communities during construction of this project. So we want to consider uh, ways that we can provide benefits to the local community above and beyond what is required under CEQA. So we started with a concept paper at the beginning of 2021. Uh, we then spent time interviewing community members. We interviewed about 45 community members earlier in the year and produced an interview summary report. Uh, we then held public and tribal community benefits program workshops to collect additional information and talk through some ideas and we had a case study workshop where three uh, participants in other community benefits programs came and talked about lessons learned and how they organized their programs. And we're working towards having a framework for the community benefits program, a draft included as part of the draft EIR. So because, because I came to you guys uh, a while ago, I did want to just give some updates about what, what we've been up to in 2021. So we have been continuing, a lot of our work in 2021 has been focused on CEQA and NEPA. So we've been continuing development of the environmental impact report and environmental impact statement to identify potential impacts and mitigation measures to reduce impacts. Uh, we've also been working on tribal consultation. Uh, we're continuing consultation with tribes to help identify uh, the potential tribal cultural resources and consider impacts and mitigation. And we've also worked with the tribes to conduct surveys on accessible parcels. Uh, for the Endangered Species Act, California Endangered Species Act, we've continued coordination with the resource agencies. We worked with them to help develop that initial set of operational criteria. And then we're also working to identify tools to assess potential effects. Uh, for water rights, we will be submitting a petition for a change in point of diversion. We anticipate that. Uh, likely in late 2022. And as part of that permitting process, the state board will be a CEQA responsible agency. So we've been coordinating with the state board about what they want to see as part of an EIR so that they can use that document for their process as well. Uh, for Delta plan consistency, we've been co coordinating with the Delta Stewardship Council through early consultation. And we've also been hosting a series of informational webinars. Uh, we did this uh, I think in July, August, and September. And the idea was that we wanted to provide some background information related to the draft EIR. We know that the draft EIR is a pretty, pretty large document. We've heard from several sources that it can be somewhat impenetrable for a public audience. 
And so we wanted to provide some some background information that would help people review it when they get the information when they get the document uh, this year. So one of the questions that that the Stewardship Council staff asked was to talk about the relationship of the environmental impact report and the environmental impact statement. So the EIR is a CEQA document and the EIS is a NEPA document, the National Environmental Policy Act. So for Delta Conveyance, the Corps must consider whether to permit the project under two permitting requirements. The first is Section 404 of the Clean Water Act and Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act which considers discharge of dredge or fill in waters of the US. And then section 408 considers alterations of federal flood projects. So because the Corps has to permit the project, the Corps is functioning as the NEPA lead and is developing an EIS to support their permitting decisions. But it, I wanna be really clear that they're not a project proponent, but a regulatory agency. So. Often the NEPA lead would be an agency that is also helping to fund or implement a project. And that's not the case here. The core is, uh, is permitting the project potentially. And so they're, they're doing this as a regulating agency. So the EIS will have similar information to the EIR, but a few key differences. So the core has some requirements for brevity. So it will be a shorter document. So the EIS will summarize and refer to the EIR in some areas. Also, NEPA does not require significant findings in an EIS. So the EIR, the EIR has a lot of discussion about potentially significant impacts. The EIS does not have that kind of discussion. And another key difference is that the baseline for impact analysis is different. So under CEQA, we look at the potential impacts of alternatives compared to existing conditions. So, so the conditions that exist at the time of the publishing of the NOP, which was January of 2020. For NEPA, well, the core will compare the alternatives to a future no action alternative. So what would happen in the future absent the project? These aren't all of the differences between the EIS and the EIR, but these are, are a few key differences. And so there will be two separate documents for review, which leads us to schedule. So uh, we are working now to prepare the draft EIR and the core is working on the draft EIS and we are anticipating public review later this year uh, we expect to release the EIR in about May or June. The core is releasing the EIS. Uh, we're trying to align at least most of the public review period. We are expecting a 90 day review period on the EIR. I think the core is looking at a shorter period, but we are trying to make sure that those periods overlap to try to help reviewers be able to look at both documents at the same time. So after that review period, we will uh, finalize the EIR the core will finalize the EIS and we're looking at decision documents in late 2023. Uh, also, we are starting some of the permitting processes, but really we expect most of the work on those to be in 2023 and 2024. So because we're moving into this public review period, I did wanna just talk a little bit about uh, public comment period. So one thing to mention is the standard of adequacy of an EIR. A lot of the public comments are focused on whether the EIR is good enough. And so a couple of things from the CEQA guidelines, the EIR should provide decision makers with a sufficient degree of analysis to provide information to make a decision that intelligently takes account of environmental consequences as evidenced by substantial evidence in the agency's administrative record. The evaluation doesn't need to be exhaustive and information should be reviewed in light of what is reasonably foreseeable. Uh, disagreement among experts does not make an EIR inadequate, but it does need to disclose and summarize that disagreement. And perfection is not the standard. So the EIR is reviewed for adequacy, completeness, and a good faith effort at full disclosure. So because the ISC is going to be reviewing the CEQA document as a public commenter, I also just mentioning some of the key types of content issues that are often provided in, in comments, public comments. So the first is the project description. Is the project adequately described to give an understanding of the potential environmental effects? For the environmental setting, uh, is the physical environment at the time of the NOP adequately described based on uh, existing and available information? Are the impacts evaluated in light of what's reasonably foreseeable? The impacts need to include direct, indirect, growth-inducing, and cumulative effects. Are feasible alternatives evaluated that meet the project objectives and would avoid or reduce potential significant impacts of the proposed projects? 
And then mitigation and monitoring are mitigation measures included to address the potentially significant impacts and our monitoring requirements incorporated. So I, in closing, I wanted to, to just sort of touch on some of the upcoming outreach activities that we have planned. So because of the draft EIR release this year, a lot of our activities are really focused around that release. So we have three key areas that we're focused on. The first is public information. And so with the idea that the draft EIR is coming out soon, we wanna help provide informational resources to help the public be able to review that document. So those could include things like videos, website information, fact sheets, graphics, et cetera. Uh, the next step is that we're looking at ways to uh, reach out and engage the public, so sort of pull people into the process. And so for that, we're, we're looking at public or proactive outreach to inform and engage. And that could include things like emails, phone calls, meetings, briefings, and presentations. And then the last column here is really focused on the, the public and participation and notification. That's the more formal SQL process. So we need to provide meaningful opportunities to access these review documents and provide opportunities to comment, uh, formally comment so that we can respond to those comments and address them. And so this could include workshops, flyers, publicity, putting information in libraries, translating materials. And uh, across all of this, we are going to be continuing our tribal consultation and environmental justice outreach processes. And just a, a couple of links in case they will help people. And, Really, the, the best way to stay up to date is to subscribe to our eBlast list. We send out updates probably once or twice a month. And the, the way to join that is listed on our homepage. So I think with that, thank you for the time. Well, thanks very much, uh, Carrie. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. I, I'm going to start out with three very simple questions. Uh, the first one is, um, what's the diameter of the tunnel and how deep is it buried? Okay, so uh, as the non-engineer, I will give you approximates. So it's it, the tunnel diameter varies based on the capacity. Uh, it's about 40 feet diameter and the inside diameter, but that it's smaller for some and larger for others. Uh, and the, the depth to the top of the tunnel is about 100 feet, but that also varies depending on where we are in the tunnel. So it's about 100 feet on the top and about 150 on the bottom. Okay. The below surface. The second question has to do with the uh, scope of the EIR. Um, is the scope of the EIR going to be principally on the impact of the construction of the tunnel, uh, or will it also be, uh, I want to say, equally weighted or uh, uh, on the operation or resulting changes in flow that the tunnel will cause and the environmental impacts related to that? So we're working to try to capture the full suite of environmental impacts, which can in include impacts from construction, operations, and maintenance. I wouldn't necessarily talk about weighting. You know, we're not saying that one set of potential effects is more important than another, but we are trying to consider and disclose all of them. So the operational changes in flow to things will be, so operations, how you operate it is going to be a, a part of the EIR. Okay, the final question is really simple. I expect a really accurate answer is how many pages long is the EIR going to be? <laughs> and uh, I asked that for the old board, new board members is the last one we did was something like 30 some thousand or more pages. So what's... Uh, so it's not written yet. And you know, we just are starting to draft it. So I don't think I can answer that. But I will say that... Uh, you are not the first person to mention to me that the California water fix document was was really, uh, let's say, too long to read for most people. And so we are really trying to make a concerted effort to make this shorter and more concise and easier to get through. How successful we will be, I, I don't know yet, but uh, hopefully at our next discussion, I'll be able to give you more details. Okay, I see Tom first and Bob. I have a fairly simple question that follows up on Steve's. Um, what's happening to all the uh, tunnel uh, muck or ex excavated material? So for the, the two, generally we are seeking to try to reuse it as part of project construction where that's possible. So for the central and eastern alignments where there is a southern four-bay facility, 
uh, there is the use of material to construct the embankments around that facility. Uh, for all of the alternatives, there is some reuse at the, the shaft sites because those shafts need to be um, sort of built up above ground a bit to maintain flood protection. So there will be some reuse there as well. Uh, the material that can't be reused is going to be stockpiled at the launch sites. So Twin Cities and some at Lower Roberts as well. Uh, that material, uh, we do allow to be reused in the future for other projects, uh, potentially levy projects in the Delta, other projects in the, the greater Sacramento or Stockton areas. But we don't know where those projects could be. And to try to make assumptions about that would be speculative. So we're analyzing leaving it there so that we can look at the potential impacts of having those stockpiles and make sure that we disclose those in the EIR. Do you have any idea about the volume of the material? For example, if we were to compare it to the, uh, I think it's what, 1100 kilometers of levees, there's a, to raise those levees would require a lot of material. Would, would, would this material be adequate to even make a dent in that? I, I don't know the answer to that question, unfortunately, but I can follow up if you'd like. Uh, I'd, I'd be curious about the scope of the, okay. the spoils. Okay, Bob, then Diane. Uh, Carrie, thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, listening to you, I realized that um, I don't really understand why this project needs to take place. Uh, could you summarize for me uh, just quickly why this project is even being proposed? So the, the main issues are related to the, the future and continued degradation of state water project diversions in the Delta. So as we look forward, uh, because of, of climate change, primarily sea level rise, potential earthquake risk and uh, changing regulations in the Delta, we anticipate future supplies for the state water project are going to decrease pretty substantially. So um, climate change, as we, we've discussed, as I discussed, and I think John did as well, uh, we do expect future conditions to be different. You know, right now the snowpack provides uh, essentially a, another kind of storage. We anticipate substantially less snow in the future. So we will have flashier winter storms, more rain, less snow, and so that alone will really change the ability of the state water project to capture that water. So having a, a program like Delta Conveyance where you can take those high, flows, those high flows and divert them will help provide a more sustainable future water supply. And along the lines of you know, environmental impacts and so on, how much consideration was given to the fact that rivers need high flows too? in order to maintain their ecological vitality. Without those high flows, they just become canals. Um, and it seems to me that, uh, well, just quickly, you know, looking from the outside is that, you know, why can't the river continue to be the, the primary form of conveyance, um, you know, during, during the, you know, during the period of high flows? So, we are definitely considering the, the potential effects to fish and other conditions within the river associated with the diversions. You know, I think that that one of the things that we were talking about is that that this would be during high flow conditions where uh, diverting the potential up to 6,000 CFS wouldn't be changing the idea that there are high flow conditions. These are really, you know, high flow periods. And so this would still be a very wet period on the river. It wouldn't be taking all of the water and resulting in a sort of dry condition in the delta, if that makes sense. So, so we, while we are diverting water, it is during high flow conditions where those that difference is a smaller percentage of the flow. And then the other thing, is, so we're looking at the conditions and how that could affect fish, water quality, and other resources in the delta. Uh, it doesn't really have any. The way that we're looking at this project it doesn't really have the potential to affect the situation upstream from the river or upstream from the delta in the river systems. We're not looking at changing operations of the reservoirs upstream or the river systems. Those would be operated the same way that they are absent a delta conveyance project. Okay. And final, final question uh, is, will uh, the public or uh, the ISP have an opportunity to comment on 
uh, how the EIR or EIS, how, how it will be structured. Uh, the reason I ask this is I've been involved in these in the past and uh, boy, the bar for, for both the EIR and the EIS as I've reviewed have been uh, shockingly low from, a, from an ecological perspective. So will we have an opportunity to comment on you know, how these documents might be structured? So that really was the point of the comments and the notice of preparation and the notice of intent, the scoping comments. So the ISB did provide comments on the notice of preparation on the CEQA side, uh, some to that type of effect. And so we are considering those during development of the EIR. I don't remember, and someone else might know if, if the ISB provided comments on the environmental impact statement to the core, but the core conducted scoping as well in August of 2020. And, and that was, you know, at this point, we're sort of further down the road, but those were the times to provide those comments. And, and we did that, Bob. Bob, we did that based on our previous uh, EIR review. So we gave them uh, a number of comments on, on how, to, uh, uh, how to present the material. And uh, okay. Di Diane? I had two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, Carrie, again, thanks for your presentation. I understood that you said that you have not decided upon the Bethany alternative. And that, but is the EIR going to be based on the Bethany alternative? And then you may still decide to go back to the central alternative, which is quite some distance from in terms of where these all, everything would be happening. So, so could you clarify that for me? Yeah, that's a really uh, good clarification that I should have made when I was talking about this earlier. So most EIRs focus on a proposed project and analyze the alternatives in much less detail. And that's what CEQA directs. But because we're um, sort of partnering with an environmental impact statement that has to consider all alternatives at a similar level of detail, we are looking at all alternatives at the same level of detail. So while we are identifying the Bethany alternative as the proposed project, we are fully evaluating Central and Eastern and the variety of different capacities. So uh, because we would have all of that impact analysis in the EIR, we would still have the flexibility later to say, you know, we, we understand that there, is, there are these other factors. And so therefore we are looking at considering this different proposed project. Okay, well, thank you very much for explaining that. And then my other question, is can you give a general answer as to whether you envision this Delta Commands project as decreasing evaporative losses or potentially increasing evaporative losses? One of the fundamental challenges of storing high flows in surface waters is you increase the surface area of where you're storing the water, and so you increase evaporative losses. So can you, uh, Give us some insight as to how, how that challenge will be addressed. You know, I don't know that I have a, a good answer to that, but that's something I can look into in more detail. Uh, you know, yes, we will be moving more water into storage during wet conditions, but it's also compared to a no to a condition without the project. And because diversions are changing, it's, it's kind of a complicated calculation. So I guess what I'm saying is, I, I don't think that I can conceptually answer that. I think I would need to look at actual storage information to, uh, to be able to do so. So I can make a note of that as well. Yeah, so is the surface area and the time over which there will be an increased surface area and warmer temperatures, is that increasing? And if so, how much? Okay. You, you, you can lose water while you're storing it is the basic problem. Okay, Lisa, then Tanya. So I have a pretty simple question that you partially answered when you're talking to Bob, but uh, if this project is, this, let me just confirm, this project is not going to decommission any other part of the existing system. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, so then, are you, as part of this, are you going to look at the long-term operation and maintenance budget and how it's going to affect that over the long-term? So CEQA does not uh, require or want you to really look at cost information. So in terms of long-term operations and maintenance budgeting, no. 
uh, because we aren't looking, you know, CEQA wants you to try to make a decision based on environmental impacts, not cost. So they, <coughs> it is a separate type of, of exercise. So uh, at this point, we are not. What we're looking at really is comparing how things change with our project than to what they would be without the project. So given that we're continuing to look at the potential to use the South Delta facilities in a pretty similar way that they would be used under existing conditions. We don't anticipate the Delta Conveyance Project changing substantially anything related to operations and maintenance requirements of that South Delta set of facilities. Okay, Tanya. Yeah, thanks, Carrie, for the presentation and the updates. Um, I had a question about the Community Benefits Program. And it, one is, could you just give a little more detail as to kind of the types of benefits that would be considered or, or might be being discussed? Um, I don't know if it's too early for that, but, um, and then how does that program kind of factor into the decision-making process here, if at all? Um, kind of how, do, how does it situate with, uh, you probably talked about some yeah. of it and I might've missed, I, missed I it, really, but I'd love to hear more. <laughs> I did a very broad overview because I could yeah. easily talk for a half hour about the community benefits program alone. So, uh, so right now what we're looking at are two key pieces associated with the community benefits program. One of them is a Delta community fund. And the idea is that it would be a fund to fund or to grant fund potential efforts of the community in support of, of maintaining the Delta's uh, eco ecological, economic, recreation, cultural values. Uh, so they're trying to really fundamentally help Delta as a place. And does DWR fund that? So it would be part of the project costs that so would be uh, funded with the construction costs. And that's funded not by DWR, but uh, it would be paid for by the water agencies that receive the water. Okay. And so the other piece of the, the effort is uh, implementation commitments. And the idea there is that there are some pieces of project implementation that may be able to provide benefits to the community as well. And so a couple of examples of those are things like uh, we're building park and rides and it's possible the communities may want those to stay after the project construction is done. Or uh, the one that, that's really talked about quite a bit is internet. So, you know, if we're putting, we're bringing high speed internet to the intake facilities, we could very easily provide sort of a, a way for our local communities to connect to that as well. So some of those types of efforts as well. So those are the key things that we're talking about. Uh, we, we got, we asked for project ideas and got a lot of them. And so we have those available in some of the presentations that we posted on our website. And um, we're, we're, so we're looking for more always. Uh, what we're doing now is that we're putting together a framework that, that's based on what we've heard and what we've discussed with the community members. And that will be part of our EIR and it will be in all of the alternatives. So it's not specific to an alternative. This is something we think matters for all of the alternatives. And so it's included across the board. Thanks. Any other questions from board members? Um, so I'm gonna ask you again, is, is May uh, a realistic time frame? Is, so we start setting aside our three months of our lives starting in May? I'm saying May or June. I don't have a date yet, but I do think that that's that at the moment uh, we're looking pretty solid on being able to meet May or June. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, I have one final question about the operation of the uh, conveyance structure. Is Burek involved uh, in any uh, consequential way in its operation? No, at this point, they haven't indicated interest in participating as a lead agency, so they are not. Uh, this is a state water project only facility. Uh, we do have some alternatives that include the potential for them to be involved. And that's partially because we have a, a record that they had been involved in water fix. And so just because people kind of want to see how the impacts and benefits would change, we did include them in alternatives, but the Bureau of Reclamation has not indicated interest in being part of the project. You know why? I, I, I can't really speculate on their motivations. It's, their choice. Okay, uh, Edmund, do we have public comments on this? 
Um, yes, um, we have two, but I just want to remind um, the public, if you register for a public comment, please make sure you also raise your hand if you still have a public comment. Um, but we'll go with Osha Mazur first, then Deirdre de Jardin. Um, so Osha, um, you have the ability to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation um, before providing your public comment to the board. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Osha Meserve, and I'm an attorney for local agencies of the North Delta, which is a coalition of reclamation and water uh, agencies in the Delta that have been working to protect the Delta um, over the past several years, um, largely in relation to the tunnel or tunnels proposals that have come up in the past, but also uh, with respect to other uh, activities that impact farming, flood control, water supply issues. And um, I am glad that um, you know, this briefing occurred today um, and that the new members of the board are getting you know, informed about uh, what's being proposed for the Delta. Um, as you might guess, um, my clients are not uh, very pleased with the proposal to remove a, a, a large amount of fresh water from the uh, very top of the Delta, just as it enters the Delta from the Sacramento River, which is the main freshwater uh, input into the Delta that's so important for agriculture, the wildlife, um, and all the different beneficial uses happening in the what the Delta, which is, you know, very, um, a, a really special place in the whole uh, West Coast. Um, I just wanted to, in listening to Ms. Buckman's presentation, the part I had a question about and I don't know if it can be answered today, but I just want to pose it is, you know, I think obviously construction is a huge concern um, to local people, but, you know, operationally, we're concerned about the long term and what happens to, to the, the salinity in the Delta, as well as things like invasive weeds and uh, harmful algal blooms and such when you lose so much of the fresh water. And I heard Ms. Buckman say pretty uh, clearly that this is really that the way they're thinking of it at DWR is as of a, you know, during high flows, but when the bypass flows were mentioned on the slide, what I had heard in a previous webinar uh, put on by DWR is that the bypass flow was suggested to be 5,000 CFS. So that's not high flow. So I guess I think it would be appropriate now or when possible for DWR to clarify what it means operationally, because if you're really, you know, most of you probably know that the Sacramento River has really broad, you know, wild variations in, in flow over the course of, of a year if we get, you know, big storms and whatnot. But, you know, when you're talking about a bypass flow of 5,000 CFS, that's not high flow. And so if DWR wanted to commit to a high flow only um, diversion, I think that would be different than anything we've heard thus far. And what's been indicated would be the uh, bypass flow for this project. Thank you. Carrie, do you have an answer? You wanna think about it? Sure. So I. I think that there probably was a little bit of confusion about some of the information that we presented this summer. The 5,000 CFS information was that below 5,000 CFS in the river, there would be no diversions at all from the, the North Delta diversion. Then between 5,000 and a number that varies on, on hydraulic conditions, somewhere between I think 11 and 15,000 CFS in the river, there would only be low level diversions. And those low level diversions are an amount that uh, the fishery agencies and, and DWR have discussed is a very, very small amount that would not have the potential to affect fish or resources in the Delta. And so from that, that amount, which is 11 or 15, depending on the conditions in the river, uh, going upwards, there would be a very small percentage incremental increase. So certainly 5,000 CFS was mentioned, but only in that below 5,000 CFS, the diversions are absolutely zero. Okay, thanks for that. Next uh, public comment. Um, <clears throat> um, Deirdre, you have permission to unmute your microphone. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deirdre, Deirdre Dan, California Water Research. Um, and I wanted to talk about the Delta Conveyance Project as an adaptation to climate change. Uh, this is an area that I've done a lot of work on. As you know, my background's in physics. Uh, so as Kerry Blackman stated, the project is proposed in part to protect the water supply for the state water project from salinity intrusion due to sea level rise. And as such, it's not just subject to CEQA and NEPA. Under the Delta Reform Act, the project is required to be consistent with the Delta plan. When the project ER is completed, in order to proceed with the project, DWR has to file a consistency determination for the project with the Delta Stewardship Council, which can then be appealed. What the key requirement of the Delta plan for the Delta ISB purposes is that DWR is required to use best available science in the project. This includes best available science on climate change, best available science on ecology, flows, et cetera. This is the second iteration of the Delta Tunnel Project. The first iteration, the Twin Tunnels Project, was planned for over a decade. In 2018, after the EIR and EIS were final, EIR and EIS were certified, DWR filed a consistency determination for that project. There were nine appeals, including an appeal by North Coast Rivers Alliance et al, who contested the determination that the project used the best available science on sea level rise. This relied in part on my testimony in the water fix hearing. The DSC staff's draft determination on the consistency appeal supported the uh, allegation by North Coast Rivers Alliance that the project did not use the best available science on sea level rise. The draft finding was in fact rather scathing. It stated, the department stated its assumptions still reflect the use of best available science because they are consistent with the recommended estimates for sea level rise under the likely range in the latest guidance from the California Ocean Protection Council. The California Ocean Protection Council, however, recommends the likely range for use in low risk aversion decisions, such as a coastal unpaved trail. Whereas it recommends the use of the H plus plus scenario, which is extreme risk aversion for projects with a lifespan beyond 2050. Um, because of this and other findings by the DSC, DWR reduced withdrew the consistent new determination for the project and went back to the drawing board. Governor Gavin Newsom was then elected to succeed Governor Brown. Newsom announced in February 2019 that he did not support the twin tunnels project, but a smaller single tunnel project. Um, in May of 2019, DWR rescinded all approvals of the twin, twin tunnels project. The following month, I met with the project team and emerged them to immediately do new modeling of the performance of the intakes with high sea level rise and disclose it to stakeholders. The modeling was reportedly done and completed this year, but has not been released for review, either by me or any other stakeholders. In the meantime, uh, DWR, under the supervision of DWR, three conceptual engineering design packages have completed with essentially the same intake locations as in the previous project. In spite of our scoping comments uh, requesting uh, uh, that DWR consider alternative sites and locations. And it isn't just an issue for sea level rise, it's also um, this design and locations of uh, the intakes were uh, expected to be catastrophic for salmon, according to opinion of Dave Vogel and other salmon biologists and state experts. So I remain concerned not only that the design hasn't been reconsidered and will be catastrophic for salmon, 
but that the project may actually increase vulnerability of a system to high, high sea level rise. And furthermore, that if operations past 2040 are not currently proposed to be considered in the CEQA document. Um, there's also a major um, issue with acceptance of the project in that um, the scientific and technical studies supporting the need for the project and the assertion that the project is necessary to protect the state water project from sea level rise haven't been disclosed. And there's no disclosure. And so the DWR has rushed ahead with the conceptual engineering design and there have been vociferous objections. And Ms. Missouri and many others have said, you know, we want you to study alternatives first. And, and this makes for a profoundly dysfunctional public input process as far as since the conceptual engineering design packages have all been completed before this analysis has been disclosed. And they've been submitted to DWR for approval and they're now working on penetrating the levees with the Army Corps of Engineers. So I, I just, again, it's just an issue of using best available science and having public processes where the best available science is discussed and disclosed to stakeholders and the justification for the process. And, and I really hope that can still happen. Thank you. Thanks, Deidre. The, uh, of course, the role of the science board is going to be to look at the science within the EIR. So that'll be a, a heavy weight on our shoulders to look at that. Um, any other questions with Carrie before we uh, close this subject? Okay, thanks, everyone. And uh, another good discussion. And uh, I hope we'll uh, get our new board member in on time so he or she can uh, help us with this. We need it. Um, the, we'll move on to our last item, item number four, which is any other uh, public comments for items not on the agenda, Edmund? Um, yes, we have one, but I also want to remind um, the public that if you registered for a public comment, please remember to raise your hand if you still have a public comment. Thank you. Um, Deirdre? you have the ability to unmute your microphone when you're ready. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I did just want to say if the board has not watched uh, the Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, I highly recommend it. And I must say the flashback when uh, they put Dr. Mindy on the other side of the car with the bag on their head and made them sign on disclosure agreements did give me flashbacks to be funding an independent site for it. Um, but I'm so glad you have your funding restored. I would say that uh, we are using uh, stills from the movie and we're doing um, more uh, social media outreach and outreach on Twitter um, to really emphasize the importance of peer review because that movie illustrated so beautifully the absolutely catastrophic outcomes that someone can have, you know, with the best intentions, um, but just simply not having adequate independent review of the science. Um, and, and we hope it's a lesson. The department, the California is just spending $37 billion on climate adaptation projects and there just isn't enough peer review, and we're very glad that uh, the Delta Independent Science Board funding has been restored. So thank you. And uh, thanks again. I did watch the movie, but I'm not going to claim it on my uh, Delta account for the time. So um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, so I'd like to call the meeting, I guess, uh, adjourned for the day or in recess, and remind everyone that we are uh, reconvening tomorrow for a full day's meeting, largely to talk about our ongoing and future reviews. And uh, that'll start at uh, 8.30 uh, tomorrow morning. So have a good night. We'll see you then. <laughs>